Finally, with the great Jerry Marzinski, I'm going to read a little uh, bio on him because I was recommended you by so many people, so many people that I respect because I have a variety of friends. So the ones that I respect a lot, when they recommend people, I, uh, I definitely listen. And so Jerry Marzinski is a retired licensed psychotherapist with over 40 years of experience working with and studying the thought process of psychotic and criminally insane patients in some of the most volatile psychiatric institutions in the nation. Jerry is a commercial pilot, a certified scuba diver, and a long-distance motorist. He has held the position of second lieutenant in the Arizona Civil Air Patrol and assistant scoutmaster. He was awarded the state of Arizona's meritorious, I haven't seen that word in a while, service award and the Pima College Apple Award for teaching abnormal psychology. Bottom line is... Uh, Jerry is a legend. And the thing that drew me, <laughs> yeah, the thing that drew me to Jerry, and let me shout out his website, jerrymarzinski.com. Uh, Jerry and Sherry's book. I've seen your interviews together. It's it's great. It's called Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind. Uh, Sherry's book, That's a Lie. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's great, man. I've listened to you for about 20 hours, I would guess. Because what drew me to wow. you, and I want to talk to you about this is as a comedian, uh, comedians are, there, there's a slight element of exorcism in being a comedian because when I heard you say the demons hate being humiliated or mocked, it's mm -hmm. so true. And there's the same thing as in so many people. Like I have a character called Ira and, uh, and it's like the guy that's like, must be nice. Oh, might be nice. Like, it's this like, it's this like attitude that so many people have and so many, and you like hear it in people's voices, this envious, um, like this envious, materialistic, self-hating, victim-y guy. And it's in so many people. And then when you start talking about how, uh, like the whisper, like your experiences in the prison system and how you ask them about the voices, most people just drug them up and they don't ask about the voices and how, it would almost appear like it was the same thing talking to so many different people. And I've seen that firsthand, almost like a priest would see it as a comedian, because I will humiliate people in a fun, funny way. Like I used to be a heckler at a Renaissance festival festival in high school. Like I used to like have a skill of mocking, you know, people. And there would be this reaction that was almost not human that I would see sometimes. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm so pumped to have this uh, conversation. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. What are you thinking about? <clears throat> well, uh, what I was doing was looking for those patterns I sent you because you were saying you saw the, the same kind of things in, um, you know, in other people. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I sent you a copy of those patterns. Oh, you emailed it to me? I'll check it out. Yeah. Because I, I even looked yeah. up Swedenborg and all these guys. Like, I've been really into what you're doing because it explains so much about what, quote unquote, crazy is. And I know I'm kind of fanboying out a little bit here. I'll let you talk in a second. But the idea that our mind is a receiver, because when I was a kid, I was told about this uh, brain damage where someone would, like, learn a language. And that never made sense to me. Like, if you got a brain injury, like, how could you speak another language? And, and as an artist, like, as somebody, you know, I do piano and I improv and I do all kinds of stuff for hours. Um, there is an element of, quote unquote, inspiration that comes from somewhere else. And I don't know what it is, but I was looking into the Swedenborg stuff about how, like, it's almost like our mind is a radio receiver. And that yeah. is exactly how I view the world. Yeah, that that's true. It's, you know, and Swedenborg also says you have two two guardian angels assigned to you that are trying to keep you out of trouble, but they don't speak in words per se. They speak in feeling and intuition. You know, like oh, hey, th you shouldn't do that. That doesn't feel right. That's now so the, true. The demonic ones that are assigned to you. We all have, according to Swedenborg, and this explains so much. We all have two demonic entities assigned to us also right now they do speak in words and they speak in your language 
and that what they do is they slip thoughts into your thought stream. And what surprised me is those thoughts sound exactly like, you know, the thousands of thoughts you have during the day. There's no like, oh, we're the, you know, we're the evil ones, <laughs> and nothing like that. It sounds just like your regular thought stream, you know, but it doesn't match your intention. You know, and uh, I, I, I learned that one day where I, I prayed for it, and it, it sounds just like my own thoughts, which surprised me, because I thought they, I thought they would be different. In in some cases they're different, but in in the vast majority of cases, they sound just like all the other stuff that's running through your head on a normal day, only the content flies in the face of your intention. You know, for example, uh, I, I use this other times. Uh, I'm here in Arizona. We, we don't cut the grass out here usually. We go out with a machete and cut, cut back the cactus. Nice. So was one day at the, <clears throat> I'm uh, out there in the backyard cutting the cactus, and I have a beautiful husky that doesn't belong in the desert. And she's running around, and here I'm cutting the cactus with a machete. And as she run by, here's a thought that just barged into my consciousness, cut her head off. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, it, yeah, just, yeah. it shocked me just having that thought. You know? So the thing is, where did that come from? That wasn't my thought. It's no thought I accepted. It wasn't my intention. So where did it come from? I would never act on a thought like that. You know, so where did it come from? So what Swedenborg says is your mind is a receiver. You choose which thoughts you want to attend to and which thoughts you don't. Okay. And he also says that none of your thoughts are your own. They come in either from the dark side or they come in from the good side. Yeah. You're the choosing. Yeah. And kind of like what you're saying about how they make it sound like it's you. It's like a hunter will dress like the forest, you know? So it's like, if there is this metaphysical plane that preys on our energy, they wouldn't just be like, cut your dog's head off. Like, because yeah. you would know, you would be like, what the yeah. fuck was that? You know, right. but if they try and blend it in where it's like they, they, because you talk a lot about identity, like the, like the identity, like, oh, that's me. That's what I am. You know, um, that's how it blends in. And I, I had this thought because I will get negative thoughts when I'm very tired, you know, and I wonder if that is the meth thing, because you've talked a lot about how meth addicts um, have a horrible time with these voices, you know, and I typically have really positive thoughts. Like I just naturally am a pretty optimistic person, but I have four little kids. And if I'm up for a couple days with crying babies, like I'll just be at like a store and I'll literally just, I'll like see somebody and, and my, and I'll have a thought like you're fat fuck, you know, and I'm like, what, why did I do that? And it's, and it, and it only comes in if I'm like really, like really worn down and tired. And I wonder if like the meth addict can be up for days and almost like something breaks where it's like, you're up for days and then you have all this energy, but you're, but like your, your receivers off and you're just getting all this negative stuff, you know? Well, one, one thing I noted with schizophrenics working with them for decades is that the voices want to keep them up. They don't want them to get any sleep. Yes. And so, so that weakens their resistance to these voices. And so a lot of times they'll, they strike. It, it's interesting the patterns they run. And, and I want to emphasize we've identified some 23 different patterns they run. And if they're running patterns, they can't be hallucinations like the psychiatric mafia says they are. Hallucinations don't run patterns. So true. Yeah, I was uh, I was listening to this podcast about someone who had audio hallucinations because there are hallucinations, but they're pretty random. Like she she was hearing seagulls. So like that could be an actual hallucination. But when you have like, right. uh, you know, or it's just like random, like a hallucination could be something, you know, just totally random. Like you're, you see like a tree breathing or something like something that's just like a little off. But when your hallucination is a coherent, like, cause I, I was a script writer in Hollywood. So it's like, 
like you write a character that has to be a coherent character with with motivations, with a backstory, with an identity, with like a plan. And when you have a hallucination that is carrying out something like that, it isn't it isn't random. It's almost like another character. And then you start realizing that there is an unseen world, both positively and negatively. And so, man, that's why I, I find your work fascinating. If you want to tell my audience about um, your experience in the prison and how you did what the other guys weren't doing, where you asked, like, what are they saying versus just chalking them up as crazy, you know? Yeah, that's one of the things that got me. When my, I first started off my career after I got out of graduate school, at the biggest psychiatric hospital on the planet. This place had 10,000 patients in it, Central State Hospital in Milledgeville, Georgia, and it sprawled over 3,000 acres. So it was the size of a small city. There was every type of mental illness known to man somewhere in there. You know? And one of the things I saw, some of the, uh, I was working with a psychiatric rehabilitation center, at the Yarborough Center at the time, and the purpose of, of rehab was to get these people out of the hospital and get them a job. And some of the most, uh, the smartest, most capable were the schizophrenics. You know, they could function very well, except for the voices and the schizophrenia. The only thing we had back then to impact that were drugs. Okay. So when I got there, I was brainwashed to believe that these things in graduate school, that these, these voices or whatever they were hearing were hallucinations because that's all they said in all the textbooks. Yeah, schizophrenics hear hallucinations. And when you think of hallucinations, you think of crazy stuff like word salad, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So after a short while, I started wondering, you know, you could tell that whatever they were hearing was affecting them. It had, a, it had an effect on their behavior. But nobody knew what they were hearing, and nobody was curious, you know, except me. And I'd, I'd ask, uh, you know, the, oh, they, the staff would go, oh, they're, they're just hallucinating. You know, but, well, what are they being told? Because obviously it's affecting their behavior. Oh, it's, they're just hallucinations. You know, forget about it. So I'm like, why aren't they even curious? You know, why aren't they in the least bit curious? And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of staff at this place. I mean, it was massive. Nobody was curious about what the voices were saying. You know? So I started asking them. Now, this was at the state hospital where psychiatrists were getting beat up by schizophrenics at a rate higher than any other the staff except the attendant staff that were with them 24 hours a day. And psychiatrists would only work with them 15, 20 minutes a month. So I was like wondering, what are they saying to these people that are setting these guys off in 15 or 20 minutes? Didn't make any sense to me. It took seven years to figure that out. But uh, it took at least a year to figure out how to talk to them where they weren't suspicious about what we were up to. Because the psych staff there uh, and the counseling staff were basically snitches for psychiatry. If some of these guys went off their meds or they started acting gorky or stupid, it was our job to inform psychiatry because they couldn't keep an eye on all these people. You know, so we were we were snitches and they knew that and they didn't want to take that medication. You know, it has horrible, horrible side effects, um, which are toxic. You know, so turns out that these these drugs are they're poison. I mean, they they they're slowly destroying the patient's brain. Of course, they won't tell that to the patient. And when that first came out, they went nuts. They went, oh, no, it's not the drugs. It's the schizophrenia. <laughs> you know? And, and uh, they're, here they are trying to block that, you know, that information. They didn't want it out. So, you know, they, they verbally debunked it. And, uh, you know, they control the universities. You know, they control the magazines. They control the journals. And that's because the, the American um, medical system was taken over by, uh, who was it, the uh, Carnegie's in the, around 1910 or so with the Flexner report. 
Yeah, and they, the Rockefellers and all those guys, yeah. The, the Rockefellers. Yeah. yeah, the Rockefellers. So they made it illegal for any university to graduate doctors, medical doctors, who didn't take a pharmaceutical curriculum. So they knocked out, you know, Tesla's electric therapy. They knocked out naturopathy. They knocked out acupuncture. All that stuff, they looked and, at and it And the like, spiritual element, too, I think was really a problem. You know, like the, like the one thing they really seem to knock, knock out, and you talk about this, and I want to make sure you, you explain this, because when you said this, it, it blew my mind. There's no test for chemical imbalance. So they say you're chemically imbalanced. Okay, so what's the, like, what's the uh, standard? Because I recently got my blood work done to see if my uh, metabolic rate is good, my organs are good, all these things are good, and there's a standard. Like, this is the range, this is when you're healthy, so what is the range of your brain's chemistry? And they're like, we don't have one. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so they don't, they don't. So when they, they say you're chemically imbalanced, they don't know what the standard is, what the chemical is or anything. They just say they that they don't even, they right? don't even know what the, what the neurological balance, the, the, the biological, the neurotransmitter balance of the brain should be. Exactly. They don't even know that. Yeah. You know, they don't have a, uh, any kind of baseline, you know? So that's one of the things that I saw when I was working at the state hospital, I'd ask all the doctors, well, what, what do you think causes schizophrenia? The honest ones would say, I don't know. Yeah. The other ones were, Oh yeah, it's a, it's a chemical imbalance of the brain. So I, I'm thinking I was watching these guys. I mean, I was working shoulder to shoulder with them all virtually all the time. Never. Did I see them do any kind of lab test, any kind of blood test, any EEG, EKG, any kind of, no. you know, any kind of uh, valid test, any kind of test to find out what the brain chemical balance should be? You think if it's a chemical imbalance, they'd want to know what the baseline was, what chemicals were out of balance and how much? No. That, that was all trash that I never, ever saw. And even to this day, did I ever see a psychiatrist give any kind of test to get any kind of baseline as to what this chemical imbalance was or what the balance should be. They don't have one. It does not exist. It never existed. It was this biochemical imbalance crap was made up by Eli Lilly when they came out with Prozac. They knew it was a bunch of crap at the time, it's but so they needed some way to explain why their antidepressants work. So they came up with this and they went, oh yeah, this explains uh, mental illness. Uh, to the, uh, and who's gonna, who's gonna challenge us on this? You know? You ever see so, Prozac Nation, the movie? No, I never saw that. There's this big Harvey Weinstein movie and my ex-girlfriend was literally the lead of the movie. And I was oh, like, wow. oh yeah, it's called Prozac Nation when they were first uh, rolling it out. And I was like, this is a commercial. Like, this isn't a movie. This is like, this is them rolling out the solution to a spiritual problem. Like, and don't you ever get this feeling like they're gaslighting the world by yes. den deny? Yeah, they're denying the spiritual realm and they're just gaslighting everybody. And, and you're like, like, think about how many people exactly. could, could be so healed. If, you know, it's like, oh, I can't sleep. My mind's always racing and blah, blah, blah. It's like, if you just explain that there's a spiritual realm like that, it, it, it makes things make sense. And then they can start dealing with it versus like, oh, no, it's your it's your brain, like your brain. We right. take these drugs. Right. Something's <laughs> wrong with you, you know? Yeah. Like you said. Yeah. And they are. They're gaslighting the entire planet, you know, and they're making like fourteen point seven billion dollars a year selling um, I have the exact figures, but that's about that's in the ballpark. Selling antipsychotic drugs and antidepressants, both of them, each of fourteen point seven billion dollars. That's the bottom line. The that money is insane. You know, yeah, and the energy and, behind and, the money because they love the energy. Oh yeah. Like, so don't the, you think you know, a this, lot of these big guys are are pretty dominated by the voices? Like, I want to ask you this because as like a truther type. You'll see these plans, like just like Rockefeller Medicine or something, where the benefit of the plan, it takes like generations. And, the, and what I know about, you know, corrupted people, materialistic people, sinister criminal type people, 
is they're pretty short term. Like they don't think like, Mwahaha, in three generations, we will control the banking system. It's a, uh, and so then when you start talking about um, the, the demons or the, the voices, do you think there's like a hierarchy where, yes. Yeah. Where there are plans that they use certain people to like bring about something like, cause I'm like, okay, this is what I used to think. I'm like, are there people that live to be 500 years and they're benefiting from these things? Because if you look at a human lifespan of 80 years, they don't benefit from a lot of these nefarious conspiracies. But then I'm like, well, you know, the jinn in Islam or the demons in Christianity, like they live thousands of years. So what if they have a plan and they use certain pieces in the system to bring about plans to humiliate the human race? Because I think so much of it has to do with subjugation and humiliation and farming for energy, you know? Well, I think you're absolutely right there. And if you, I don't know if you had a chance to look at those patterns I sent you. Oh yeah, read them when uh, okay. I, I I don't I didn't see them here, but I I'm a fan, man. I've uh, I've checked out those patterns. I went to your website where it's like a uh, anti-religious, negative, you know, like it's they, they follow this thing. And as an f- actual farmer, like I I literally farm and and cultivate cows and goats and everything. They're like they're doing they're like doing almost like a um, what's it called terraforming. They're like setting an environment where they can grow what they want to eat, which is us sinning like a humiliation, hatred of self, uh, isolation, promiscuity, you know, alcoholism, condemning your fellow man, like not teaching your, you know, all the, and it gets so biblical. And I like how you shouted out Islam too, because Islam uh, has a lot of knowledge about the, the jinn and the demons too, you yeah, know. Much more than the Christians. They the do. Christians like, kind of blow it off. It's like, oh, that's a 2000 year old fairy tale. That's very, very dangerous. That's why I start looking know? into Islam is because like I was raised Catholic and I'll shout out the Catholics that they, there's a type of Catholic that still has understanding of the demon, demonology, demon realm. Um, they're out there. Like, I'm not saying all Christian, obviously, but mainstream Christianity at this point is denying the existence of demons. <laughs> and so that's, a, that's, a, that's very dangerous. It's dangerous, the, man. The, and the, the voices m- that the schizophrenics hear are them. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, exactly. They're, they're the demons. They are not the person. And think now, of, yeah, go ahead. They insert those thoughts into the schizophrenic's mind also. And since we're told from the time we're little kids that every thought that you have come into your head belongs to you, then they just assume, yeah, that's me. That's who I am. If you believe that, that's what you become. If you believe what these voices are telling you, you become that. And it's very evil. Well, here's some crazy dude. And I think you're one of the few people that would ju- that would understand what I'm saying and not just say I'm crazy. Okay, what pronoun would they have? It would be they, them. You know what I mean? It's like they are legion. So it's like when you're dealing with it, because I keep hearing identity. I got in a lot of trouble making fun of the Caitlyn Jenner situation uh, six, seven years ago. And it wasn't even like, quote unquote, hate. Like I've never been like, oh, they're all evil. I'm just like, I just make fun of it. I make fun of the ridiculousness of this pattern because uh, you know, I was raised, my parents were college professors. So I wasn't, I was raised in a relatively liberal upbringing where I had access to that type of person. So it isn't like it's this ignorant hate. Like I, I know what it is. And so when they say, uh, my pronouns are they, them, I'm like, dude, so you're like multiple. So that that's, that's plural. Like that's a singular pronoun versus a, a pronoun with multiple identities. It's like, Okay, like, does anyone want to point out, you know, like the image of the Baphomet and the, you know, the, the, the like the, the man with the breasts and the freaking, you know, and I'm like, is this demon related? <laughs> and people well, are just. The voices, like, the voices are male and female. Right, exactly, exactly. There's, there's both. Yeah. You know? And, and these patterns, I mean, if you, you read them over, you'll see that. What's coming out over mainstream media right now matches exactly, exactly. one-to-one yeah. these patterns. 
you know, the negativity, the anti-religious, the fostering negative emotion, the energetically draining, the inciting fear, the the self-destructive behavior, uh, fostering isolation, you know, demand the attention of their, it just goes on and on. All, all 23 patterns are covered by what is coming over the mainstream media right now. It's the same exact thing on a macroscopic scale. It's so true, dude. And I started my own social media, uh, the Bertari Times, and our motto is the good, the true, the beautiful. So I used to get kicked off social media all the time. And so people were very surprised that I was so heavy with censorship. Like no negativity is on there. Like none. Like you can't, I don't even want to hear about Bill Gates and vaccines or n none of that. It's just, you know, post what you're proud of, you know, look for, like if you have an idea to start a, a business, like you're looking for other people or like a get together, or like something you're growing in your garden. And people tell me all the time, they're like, I go on that app and I feel I get more energy. You know, they're like, or like we had a festival and they're like, I, I feel like I have all this energy from this. I'm like, yeah, because it is a balance. Like you have the, the, the angelic subtle beings and you have the loud, like parasitic demons and you get to choose. Like you really, like this world isn't unfair. That's the craziest thing. It's like, because in the truther world, a lot of people are like, oh, they're, they're doing it to us. Like they're gonna, they're gonna bring about, you know, agenda 2030 and everyone's gonna live in a pen. I'm like, no, you always get to choose. You always get to choose. If you want what they're offering, yes. And so you can make your own media, like you can make your own platform that doesn't allow that behavior. And, you know, a lot of people are less drawn to it because the trauma, you know, I got another theory I want to throw out to you is uh, trauma opens people up to this negativity a lot. And I think that's why yes. they push child abuse because yep. it's like, because I, I'm relative, I have my traumas and everything, but it's, but I had a, you know, I had a stable family. So it's like, I look at some of my friends that were involved in like horrible traumas and they had to work really hard to stay out of the victim consciousness, you know? And I think that's why they like trauma. Like they want to hurt kids. Cause I never understood yes. that. Like who the hell would want to hurt a kid? Like, it's yeah. like kicking a puppy. Like why, why would anyone, or like chopping off the head of your dog. It's like, who, what the hell is that? The What's, psychiatric voices, the psychotic voices hate kids. They absolutely hate, hate kids. Because they're I, innocent and the I, kid can I, see I, them. The kid can like, the, the kid is like everything they're not. Like the kid would never sell out anything for money. Like the kid is just like happy and filled with energy and everything right. the demon is, they're like, because I have four kids under eight right now and they'll literally have a balloon. And for hours, they're just like, ha ha ha, balloon. And, and just yeah, pure they joy. Stand that. Yeah, they hate that. And they want to get yep. in and hurt it. So the kid's isolated and broken. And, and right. it's just so That's obvious exactly now. Exactly right. Yeah. I, I had one guy, one guy write me. Now, he was hearing voices. And I said, what have you found that helps you? He said, well, I, I go to TikTok and I got these videos of kids laughing. He said that drives the voices nuts. Yeah. I found that real interesting. He said they can't stand it. Dude, and they I would post and I would post either. and I'd post videos of my kids playing violin and like all this happy stuff in my family. And I would get so many death threats, dude. Like so many people would be like, I know where you live, I'm gonna fucking kill your kids and blah blah blah. And I, I know what they're doing because they don't want me to show happy families. Like they always want the family unit to appear to be like horrible and you know, broken. And if you have a child, your life is over and you can't buy shoes, you know this super negative thing to get people to hate kids. And I'm like, that, yeah, they hate they seeing happiness. They, they, that's right. And they can't stand families being together and happy. They can't stand relationships being together and unfractured. They'll go into the head of, of whoever's hearing them and say, well, your boyfriend's cheating on you or your girlfriend's cheating on you or your wife's cheating on your husband. They'll keep inserting those kind of thoughts to break up the relationships. They don't want people to have good relationships. So they don't true, want them man. to have happy families. Yeah, and the Muslims have this thing where they say when a demon gets when a demon gets the uh, the wife and husband to fight, they get to sit on Satan's throne for the day. 
Like they think that's like the ultimate for a demon is to get the family unit to break. And bro, I've had that. Like I've had like thoughts that I thought were my own be like, Amy thinks you're fat. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm like, no, she does. you know, it, it's so funny, man. They, they want to, they want to get that husband and wife to, to fight so bad because that unit you know, is the protection of the child, which, and every time you have a functional child that grows up into an adult, their little demon realm doesn't get like what it wants. Cause it's all consent driven. Like I'm a, I believe in God. And so it's like, we are given free will. And so I think that is a gift that, that they can't deny, but they can try and get us to want what they're offering. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, with the anger and the hatred and and the conflict, and you 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 look at you look at the world right now. I mean, there's since in the last two thousand years or so, or thousand, I think it's thousand years. There's only been two hundred and seventy three years of peace. Yeah. The rest, there was some war somewhere in the world, and it's due to these things. It is, man. And people are ignoring their existence, and you know, like they say the. The, the biggest joke that the devil ever pulled on people is convincing them that these demons and, you know, Satan do not exist. So, yep, it's so true. And the funny thing is as a comedian, so I do a lot of racial jokes and you'd think that that causes division, but in reality, it's how people get along because the thing that I've noticed and why the media wants to eliminate all racial comedy, like all you know, making fun of each other's culture. Like, you know, like back in the day, the comics would make fun of how one group talks or dresses or whatever is because when you don't give that pressure release on, on grievances or differences, it builds up into potential violence in the future where people get like, you know, they're like, well, we have to do something. We have to just kill all of them, you know? And that's so not true. Like to get to that point, you have to eliminate the comedian that, that so when the comedian is making fun of uh, the groups together, like I would do these shows in Manhattan and San Fran and Miami, and each group would watch the other one laugh of like the of of like what they are, what they do. You can't hate them at that point. Like the laughter is like this gel, and so to get people to like uh, like right now, you can see a rise in Jew hate. And I was always known for making fun of Jews, but the funny thing is is I would do it in a way that humanizes and it's just funny. It's like, it's just like a funny thing versus like, oh, they're the reason there's evil in the world. The, 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 the voices want you to think another person is why there's evil versus like the person is like damaged in listening to this shit, you know, on any level. Like no, there is no demographic that's just bad. There's just these differences. You, you know what I'm saying? And so that's why as a comedian, I wanted to talk to you because I'm like, the same media that's pushing all this hell is also acting like if you do a racial joke, you're, you hate the race. Like they are lying. And so why? And I'm like, what the hell is it? It's like, cause I think their dream is like a race war or like a, or like oh, a yeah. religious genocide or whatever, because and in order to get people to that pen, you know, like that animal pen, you can't let them release any anger. Like it has to be like so like vol like a vile that that you agree you permit that to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like that. That's that's yeah. I don't know. I, I know I'm ranting a bit, but it's like very few people I think even acknowledge the demon realm and like that they have plans. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like oh, they do, and they have a they have a hierarchy too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the and low I've, level, I've like our, our yeah, like our buddy, yeah, like they they I've, like go ahead. Sorry, I've I've spoken to them. Ooh. You know, when I was in the prison, and the 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 agreement I had with these prisoners that I was working with, and and it wasn't a large number. I've always had ten or twelve around me who agreed to tell me in real time what their voices were saying. You know while we were talking. Whoa. So I've had conversations with them and they are nasty. You know, 
they're they're nasty. They're they're evil. They they tell the pay the, the person, you're no good. You're rotten. You're ugly. You're stupid. You're you. Nobody likes you. Uh, uh, any rotten thing that you can think of, they they will throw at the person. Yeah, and they because they and want the you person, to accept it. They want you to accept you their to identity. Accept yeah, yeah. Right. And I see and that if you accept it, you become that. Dude, because I see it on social media because I don't have that in my head. Like, I have a pretty happy disposition, although sometimes if I'm tired, I, I call people fat in my head. But uh, on social media, you'll see them talking like demons. They'll be like, kill yourself. Just kill yourself. Like, you're a piece of shit. Like, you're, like your wife's a whore. Like, your mother's a whore. You kill yourself. And I'm just like. That's them. That's that. Dude, it's them. Like you'll go on That's Reddit that. or some of these pages and it'll, and it's just all lies too. They're also super comfortable with lying. They'll be like, Oh yeah. Oh, Owen, like Owen's it. trans. Owen's Owen wife's trans. Lying. Owen's wife's trans. Owen's trans. They do, they do, they do, they, you know, they're all secretly lying and stealing. And dude, they, they're under a creed where if you believe them, you're at fault. Like they, they mock you if you believe them. And dude, I, I watch it because it's like, there's whole, hives of them on the social media where they'll just be like, well, they'll just say any lie. And I've, you've talked about this where it's like, we're like, uh, you had a patient that like stabbed himself in the eye because the, the voice is said, if you stab yourself in the eye, we'll go away. And then they just laughed at him, you know? Yeah. After he did it, he gouged out his eye and, and they came back and they started mocking him and saying, look how stupid you are. Now you now you look like a monster. Nobody's going to be want to be around you now. How how could you believe us? You know. So they do stuff like that. The one one of the horrible ones I heard was, you know, the, I heard this twice is where there was there were a female that was plagued by these things because her father had badly abused her. I mean, badly, physically, sexually, emotionally. I mean, she hated the guy. So she was here. She was hearing voices and she went to the dad's funeral when he died and she was happy. He was gone. It's like, thank God he's out of the picture now. I don't have to deal with him anymore. And, uh, you know, she thought uh, the voices came back and they mimicked the father oh. because they, they know about the low frequency stuff that people have done. Okay. So they, they come back with all this stuff that nobody else would have known and go, Hey, you know, I'm still here. Remember when we did this and when we did all these horrible things oh, you know? man. And, and she's just, she's just like blown away thinking it's never going to end. Now he's, now he's dead and he's still here. You know, I've heard that twice where they, where they do that. Ugh. You know, Sherry, Sherry says, any negative thought about yourself or anybody else comes from the dark side. That's how you identify them. The other, the other way is by their intention. You know, if their intention doesn't match your intention, like with my dog, you know, my intention was far from hurting my dog. <laughs> yeah, of course. So I knew, I knew that wasn't me. You know? Yeah. Didn't but, Sherry come know, up it, with that, that uh, protocol called that's a lie. Yeah, she did. That's now, really I helpful. I realized that, it is. I realized that they told lies all the time at the time, but Sherry brought it to a new level. You can know, you explain with, with her yeah, that's you, a lie program. Can you tell the people about about that? Because I've incorporated that into my life a lot. Where, uh, especially with trolls too, it's just like that's a lie. You're a liar. It works, and it, I, it works on your thoughts. Where it's like, no one's ever gonna love you. Just go. That's a lie. It, it were, all right, right, go ahead. Tell the people. And, and, and the reason it works is because if you don't believe it, they can't get their hooks into exactly. it. Exactly. You know, they want you to believe the lies and the bull crap that they're telling you, you know, and people, people don't realize that they're, it, look at it this way. You got this thought stream full of all kinds of crap running all the time. Good stuff, bad stuff, all kinds of stuff, just blabbing away in your head. If that's the real you, who is it that's listening to it? Boom. So you're the one who's listening to this crap. You're the one who chooses where you want to put your attention. Just like the, the, the Indians, the Native Americans said, you got two wolves on each shoulder. The one that you put feed is the one that's going to grow. Yeah. The thoughts you pay attention to are the thoughts that are going to grow. So, you know... The, the big thing is people don't realize that their thoughts don't come from them. 
that their 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 mind is like a radio receiver. You know, they they tune in to these these frequencies, and and schizophrenics are tuned to a very low frequency. You know, and the voices want to keep them there, so if they can try to force that dial, but the voices turn it back. They don't want people thinking good thoughts. They don't want people being happy. They don't want people laughing at comedians. You know, they they don't find anything funny. You know, they 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 hate everybody. They hate themselves. They hate everybody else, and they're marked by just a lack of love. They don't have any love, none, and they're deluded themselves. They've been told by their higher ups that they have no light in them. That if they don't do what they're told and torture the the people they're assigned to, that they they will they will cease to exist. You know, if they don't carry on their task. I even had one one gal where the voices weren't one voice wasn't mean enough. So they came and they replaced him with a different voice. So there's a hierarchy of these things. So you know? true, man. Whoa. Yeah, and it's like the, the lower ones are just loud chaos guys. I think the higher up you go in some of these pyramids, like in um entertainment, like I I was very close to a lot of very, very, very powerful people. And that's why I, I even humanize those people. Like I really don't have a hatred for even some of the people that are uh, on some level responsible for some of the horrors of the world, because I know how they're being puppeted. It's all these like deep insecurities and like uh, childhood traumas. And I think that's why some of these quote unquote elite families will intentionally abuse their kids uh, to open that doorway so that like the other realm can tell them things. And there are t a type of demons, in my opinion, that aren't screaming at you and telling you to uh, jab a, you know, jab a knife into your eye. They're telling you like what will work on a global level with like financial enslavement. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're they're pretty much doing that. You know, the the fiat system is about to collapse. You know, we're we're to see it. You know, but yeah, the, it, one of the first things I noticed about them was their negativity. You know, they were consistently negative. When I was working at the state hospital and I started talking to these guys, what are they telling you? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They were consistently, persistently negative. You know. So my question was, if there are hallucinations, why aren't they random yeah, like yeah, yeah. all other hallucinations? <laughs> you know, why, what holds them onto that negative path? Yeah, like why isn't there a schizophrenic that's like, look out the window, there's a beautiful sun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, you, you should work out, that. you know, what a blessing today is. Like you'll never hear a schizophrenic be you'll like, never hear that. No, it's like, nope. it's always bad. And they're always trying to pull you down. And it's like, they are being right. employed in their own world. Oh man. It's so true. And if they're, if they start becoming too positive, I was trying to write a script once called Gary Rothschild, where it was like the Rothschild that just wanted to be a normal guy and like, and like farm and how like his family members got really mad at him. And it's like that in the demon realm where it's like, because the, the, you know, the, um, the Muslims call a lot of them a uh, jinn and they say yeah. that they have their own will, you know, they're like the jinn, like the genie in the bottle. Like that's where that comes from. And they almost have to be wrangled to do evil too. Like you could theoretically have a positive jinn, like a positive disembodied soul, but they seem to have this, this hierarchy down where if you're not tormenting uh, man, like you're not allowed to get in their head, you know? Yeah. And the, the other, the other outstanding characteristic or tr pattern that I saw, so these earlier ones were just in your face. I mean, they're just in your face. They're anti-religious. Okay. They can't stand the person reading the Bible. They can't stand them going to church. They can't stand them following any kind of positive spiritual path. They become volatile. If the patient repeats the 23rd Psalm, the first time I, a patient came to me and said, you know what happens when I repeat the 23rd Psalm? The voices react like worms thrown onto a hot frying pan. 
Yeah. So when I heard something like that, <laughs> I would make a note of it and I wouldn't forget it. And then I had, an, uh, you know, an endless, a virtually endless supply of schizophrenics to work with, which most people don't have access to. <laughs> they you know, don't let people I've like me in there. Like that. I would, I would love no, to. Yeah. I have, I have never, ever seen a researcher on the front lines of mental health ever. Yeah. You know, in, in over 40 years, I've never seen a researcher on the front lines. They all come out of the universities, brainwashed by the universities, manipulated by the universities. They're not going to be publishing anything like this. So these patterns are, are they're kind of like, you know, these voices are energetic. Your thoughts are energetic. Your memory is energetic. We're talking about energy and frequency here. They're low frequency energetic beings. Right? So when you pour chemicals on the brain, you're not, you're not interfering with the electrical nature of these things. You know, you're just dumbing down the brain. Right, right. It's like, so, it's like smashing the computer to affect the internet. <laughs> or like pouring syrup on the computer. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't get rid of the voices for the most part. Yes. I mean, I've heard sometimes where it did in the early stages, but for the most part, the vast majority of times, the voices don't disappear. The only reason those those drugs work is they, they calm the patient down. And the voices want them upset. They want them negative. They want them anxious. They want them volatile. They, the voices don't like those medicines, which is why psychiatrists get the crap beat out of them at a rate higher than any other doctor, because they are the ones prescribing these things. You know, I know I, I saw that they weren't beating up psych nurses. They weren't beating up uh, counselors or psychologists or regular nurses. They were beating up psychiatrists. They have a very high assault rate. Dude, it's almost, it's, almost like, it's almost like the psychiatrist, the voices would see them as like ruining their crop. Right. Yeah. Right. Because they are damaging the man. You know, it's almost like burning a crop field. So it's like the, the drugs would shrink their brain and the voice couldn't like eat. And so they're like, you're ruining my, is that, I want to ask you about that. It, so when you no, talk, no, no. It, that, that, that shrinking of the brain is over, over a long period of time. So what they found with the autopsies of patients in mental hospitals, they would do autopsies on them and go and see that their brains were shrunken like walnuts. Yeah. And they go, what's going on with this? You know, and other patients in the, un, under the same circumstances with different meds. Now this is with phenothiazine you know, antipsychotic drugs, but people taking lithium or antidepressants or that kind of stuff, they don't have that same brain shrinking. So everything is like evened out. They're on the same ward in the same hospital, you know, with the same staff, all that's, all that's evened out. But the schizophrenics who have been there for a long time have a shrunken brain. Whoa. So when they first discovered that through the autopsies and published it, now it's amazing that they were able to get something like that through the universities because they usually screen that kind of stuff out. So the, the, the psychiatric mafia and big pharma goes, no, no, it's not our drugs. It's, it's the schizophrenia doing that. Yeah. The schizophrenia is doing that, you know, and who's going to, who's going to stand up to that. The vast majority of people don't have access to uh, a biological lab or the knowledge and how to use it. So, the, the good guys who, who found this and believed in it, they started giving these phenothiazines to monkeys and, and rats and, and, you know, other animals. And they found that their brains shrunk. They didn't like that because it interfered with their income, their, their $14 billion a year. You know? Nor have I ever heard a psychiatrist tell a patient that's the long-term effect of these drugs. Bro, is that why they call it's, them it's, shrinks? Is that why, is it like, is that it? Like when they're like, oh, I'm gonna go get my head shrunk by a shrink. Is it literally <laughs> about shrinking I, their brains? I, I, I don't know if that's where it came from or not, <laughs> but it's the truth. It's pretty funny it's, though, right? It, the, 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 the term fits, you know? So what, one of these things, they, they're anti-religious. So why would a, why would a hallucination react negatively to the 23rd Psalm? You know, and once I found something like that out, I would test all these other patients and say, here, try the 23rd Psalm when the voices come and tell me what happens. 
all the way from the state hospital, all the way through working at the mental health centers to uh, working at the state prison. It was the same thing. The voices act. They hated the 23rd Psalm. They hated the 91st Psalm. They hated the Bible. They hated the church. Consistently in virtually every schizophrenic patient. So why would a hallucination be anti-religious? I mean, even on a frequency level, the 23rd uh, Psalm is about, uh, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. And it's about being in the valley. So it's like the narrow path versus the wide path. Like, even if you look at it as a frequency, like radio waves versus, uh, you know, ultraviolet w waves, they want a wide gate where, like, anything goes uh, as long as it's horrible, you know? And right. then, like, the, the 23rd Psalm is about not being afraid and to, to accept the narrow path. And so, yeah, that, that completely undercuts their entire thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so they, they're, they're, they're out to create and foster negative emotion. That's what they feed off of. So they are parasites. And I noticed that even when I was working at the state hospital, before the voices come, the patient had a fair amount of energy. You know, after the voices attacked, they didn't have any energy. You know, they were drained. So I actually did a, a, a test on this with, with schizophrenics. I got, I got a one to 10 scale. And when they came in, I'd have them go, how much energy do you have before the voices came how much energy do you have after the voices came? Okay, It was subjective, but we ran an analysis of variance on it, and it was statistically significant. Whoa. You know, so where, did the, where does that energy go? I, I didn't know. I just knew that was a phenomena. What I thought for, for close to a decade was that these voices are so horribly negative that, and the, these people are bombarded by them 24 hours a day. It just doesn't stop. It's like somebody mocking you and lying to you and making up, you know, making you paranoid and, and getting you to misinterpret reality and, and telling you all these things that are false. If you buy into it, you're, you're become a basket case. Right. Yeah. It's like my Twitter. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Like I can just turn it off, but <laughs> some people can't turn it off. Like for me, it's, there really is that in social media, like that really like what you just described is what they do all day long in social media. And then they get exhausted and then they can't function and then they get on drugs and then they're unemployed and then they lose their relationships with their family. And all day long, they're just like, no, you're a piece of shit. Like you secretly. You're... And it's it's do you think it's getting worse? Yes, I do, too. Yeah, I think it's getting worse. I mean, it's. Uh... You, you can look at it. You can see it. You can turn on the news. You can see it's getting worse. Yeah, you look at the, the murder rate, the assault rate. It's all going up, you know. So, you know, the, the number of of, uh, of suicides, you know, in, in the U.S. Horrifying. Yeah, you know, horrifying, you know. It's, it's I have the, the stats here somewhere. It's around, uh, it, it's virtually close to... Um, 50,000 a year. Yeah, and that's not okay, even that's including what, the ODs that were probably suicides too. You know, like the voices being like, yeah. take all the fentanyl, your mom hates you. You know, like that shit. It's so right. sad, man. When I think too much oh, about it, it, it like, that's why I try not to give in to sadness because the ironically, the demons want that. Like they want me to yeah, be sad do. about what they do. You know, they do. So, so this, you can look at the statistics and see the damage. So right now we have more psychiatrists, we have more psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, and more of these psychiatric drugs on the planet than any other time in human history. And look at this, you know, in 2021, 48,000 Americans killed themselves. The rates increasing every year. Last year, it was just, you know, a few hundred short of 50,000. 50,000 people kill themselves every year just in the United States with, you know, tens of thousands of psychiatrists with every, every pharmacy, you know, dishing out psychiatric drugs. You know? Unreal. And the CDC reports that 132 people in the U.S. kill themselves every day. Suicide's the 11th leading cause of death in the United States. You know? Between 1999 and 2019, the suicide rate in the U.S. increased 33 percent. 
an estimated 24 veterans kill themselves every day. Now you talk about trauma. You know, yeah. These guys are trauma victims. You know. So 100,000 Americans are diagnosed with schizophrenic every year, and schizophrenia every year. You won't hear about that. Matter of fact, what they've done is they've they've cut the research funds for schizophrenia to a mere dribble. They don't want people recovering. They're making too much money from it. You know, schizophrenic suicide at a rate of three to five times that of the general population. Four in ten suicide. Uh, uh, schizophrenics were attempt suicide. The National Institute of Health estimates 4.9% of people with schizophrenia will die by their own hand. Okay. Now, get this the antidepressant market in the U.S. is expected to reach $15.98 by 2023. This crap doesn't help anybody. It makes them reliant on drugs. There's a new energetic therapy that has recently come out that they're totally ignoring called the MACE energy method. I'm glad I was that just going to ask you about that. I'm really, I really want to know about that. Yeah, tell us about MACE. Yeah, in most cases, it will cure most psychological disorders. You know, it works energetically. How does it, it goes work? goes in there. Well, what it does is it goes in and it discharges trauma. All right, got a method to do that. And once that trauma is, is discharged, it doesn't come back. It's gone. You know, so if somebody was badly uh, uh, abused as a, a child, you can go in there and you can, you can find that and get rid of that trauma. Mays found that the, he, he, he found that the, the mind isn't what people think it is. And he, he says that the mind, all it does is focuses your attention. You know, it creates a picture of where you focus your attention. And it, it, it's not, it doesn't think, it doesn't analyze things, it doesn't see anything. It, it, it just takes pictures and, and of, of where you focus your attention. It's so true, man. You know? So true. So I don't know. You know, I remember one time I did a light dose of LSD and I swung my hand in front of my face like that. You could see the, what, the I don't know what they call it, the, the jerky motions. Yeah. The trails, I guess yeah. they called it. You know, so you could actually see the mind taking pictures of, of when the, the arm moving. That's so interesting. Because that, like in, um, in movies, it's about the rate of a picture. Right. Because your mind can't tell the difference. Like I'm, I'm really into uh, analyzing these uh, these uh, mind tricks, like these uh, illusions, like actual illusions, like the color magenta. You ever looked into magenta? Mm -mm. So the, the way our mind works with with seeing color, it it it's like combining things. So it's like a a wheel, not a line. And so magenta doesn't actually exist. It's a combination of the two ends of the line. That, that your mind just does. It's, it's, I don't know, it sounds a little complicated, but it's super interesting. It's the same with like, with that. So when you're watching film, it's just a series of, of pictures. And then you get into a faster rate, you know, 30p versus 28p. And that's all your mind does, you know, at all so, times. So, it's, so just, it's just putting together a movie. Well, tying that into maze is like freezing the film. And you have one frame, which stops the progression. Yeah, and how do you do and that? I'm always trying to get rid of my memories of Coddington in, in the chat. I'm just kidding. But how do you get to that and get rid of it? Like, Because I've heard you talk about, Mace, of getting to the root of trauma. But let's say you get that picture in your head. How do you get rid of that? Well, I'm not sure you can do it yourself. I've been told you can't. You know, And I've, I've tried it myself. I'm not sure it works, but but back to the film, it's like freezing a film, a, a, a frame on a film, you know, movie film, okay? And then putting your attention on it and dissolving it and the whole film breaks apart. Just the whole thing goes down. You can't run it anymore. The, the projector runs out of the, the film and, and it's, it's done, it's gone. So funny, man, I do that with jokes. So it's like, 
Cause that's always my, cause like a masseuse will find where it hurts and they like hit that. Right. Like you brought up, um, uh, vets committing suicide. And, uh, I have a lot of vet listeners because I make fun of them for being vets. And you think that that would, you'd think that that would cause them pain and like make their life go worse. Like on veterans day, I'm like, haven't you guys gotten enough? You know, you get a discount at home Depot. You know, I'm like, if you really laid it on the line out there, we'd be talking about you on Memorial Day. You know, like I'm totally making fun of them and they'll laugh and it like breaks the film. It like breaks the narrative that they're a victim where it's like, you know, I went to Afghanistan. I did shit that I'm not proud of. And then I find out it's all a lie. And then I come home and people aren't giving me respect. But I did. And it's like, if you can break that cycle, they just laugh and then it's like over it's almost like a spell is broken you know that's why they call me a spell breaker because it's like and that's why what you describe with mace is so interesting to me because that is how it works like you have it's almost like logic where it's like if therefore that if then if then if then and you just break one of them and then it just like doesn't work the whole thing yep <laughs> yeah. that's how it works so so there's a there's a website what mace has it's www.maceenergymethod.com backslash about backslash cool yeah so people should check that out yeah you check that out john mace wrote two books you know that'll help you understand how this stuff works a little better and how the mind works because you think psychology and psychiatry have any idea how the mind works no they're not even in the freaking ballpark they're in the stone age they have no idea you know they think the mind is the brain no that the it's, it's the spirit that is in the body, and they don't talk about the spirit at all. It's a spirit that runs us. It's like, like the driver of a car. The, these, these bodies are just, they allow us to exist in the physical world, you know, but they're, they, they, they don't think, you know, they don't have any life. The life is within you. It's not the body. Without the spirit, the body drops dead and rots. What do you think happens when we die? Like, what do you think that process is like? Well, if you go to YouTube, there's a whole bunch of people that talk about uh, uh, past, uh, what they died and came back. Yeah, yeah, I've been looking into you that. Know, and, the, and, and they're all virtually saying the same thing. You know, it's always said there is an afterlife. This, this is not the end. So yeah, the, the mace me- the mace method is going to be much more effective than psychiatry. Yeah, and you know? if you if you look at it like the voices trying to get people to kill themselves, it's almost like they get a point for it because I yes. don't think death is the end either. So it's like let's say we die and we go somewhere else. It's almost like it's a bit of a game, and if you kill yourself, they get a point because yeah. like you don't actually you know what I'm saying, and so. Because, or else it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would, because I have, lo- just like you, I've logically concluded there are entities. Like, I, I've, because you were very skeptical at first, too. And I was even skeptical when I was oh, yeah. first listening to you talk about it. I'm like, oh, criminals are liars. But, and then you started yeah. talking about how, like, the voice would know something that you, it couldn't possibly have known. And I've talked to our mutual friend, Patrick, about that, too. And I've just seen behavior that doesn't make any sense outside of, you know, the entities, you know? No, especially with meth addicts. I mean, when I talked to them in the prison, a number of them would say that the voices would tell them where to go and when to be there in order to get more meth. And if they showed up at the place and time that they were told, some stranger would walk up with more meth. It's crazy. Just like that. They, there was a, a number of them. They would say the voices told them which houses to break into, generally where the loot was, when the people were up in the house, and where to go, where to go run and hide. You know, there's one guy said he, uh, uh, he he broke into the house. The people were in there. He was looking for the loot. The voices told him the people were up. You know, and they warned him to get out of there. So the, the people called the police, and this guy got got the loot. He took the time to get the loot, and then he jumped out the window, and he went to run down this alley. And the voices said, "Don't do that. They're coming. The cops are coming down that alley. Go around this other way." So he goes around the other way, and there's a dumpster there. 
And they said, go jump in the dumpster, hide in the dumpster. So he's hiding in the dumpster. The cops come. They, they're they walking right past or, or driving right past where he was. And uh, as soon as they passed, the voices said, okay, now get out of the dumpster and run. All right. So he did that and got back to his apartment. And the voices said, good job, good job. And uh, he said, well, no, not good job. I, I left all the, all, the, all the loot in the dumpster. They said, not a problem. You just go back and get it in the morning. You know, it's they, crazy. they would know stuff in a lot of cases that the patient himself didn't know. The, the, the most dramatic of these stories was one guy, uh, he's a prisoner. Uh, he had a big, large criminal, uh, clinical record or um, criminal record. And a clinical one too. I mean, he was he was psychotic. Um, now he fully recovered. While I worked with him, the, 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 the psychiatric mafia will tell you, "Oh no, it's impossible to recover from schizophrenia." That's a lie. That's a big lie. You hear that, Jackobat? You, know, you can a, recover, Jackobat. Sorry, I'm talking to the chat. Go ahead. Um, I've had a number of people that that did recover. Maybe a dozen. It's not a, a no. I've a seen giant it too. Number. I've seen it too. They need a uh, ritual purpose. Uh, you know, purpose is huge. Like isolation is where it festers when they're just, that's where they want. Yeah. When they're alone all the time, thinking about dumb shit, looking on the internet all day, you get them to like do an actual job. That's why I think the demons like welfare. I'm not even kidding. Cause like, cause oh, yeah, they want the person bored and just listening to their bull crap all day. Exactly. That's the worst exactly. thing that could be done. Yeah. Like that's actually working thing. is, is really good for men, especially it's like, Right. Even if it's menial, like pushing a mop, doesn't matter. Moving bricks, doing anything will, it's, I always call it like, that's how I meditate. Like I don't meditate, uh, like sitting around, like I meditate by like doing physical tasks, like building a fence or, you know, wrangling, uh, animals. And if you're doing that, the, the voices are not there. Like they can't really do well, it. It, it. It is a battle for your attention. Totally. You know, they are fighting for your attention. They will do anything to get your attention. You can't ignore them because they get louder. Now, I've seen psychiatrists tell patients numerous times, oh, they're just hallucinations. I'll ignore them. And I remember the first time I called the patient back after sitting in a psychiatrist's office and watching that happen. I was curious, like, does that really work? So I called the guy back and I said, uh, Hey, I, I was with you when uh, last week when the psychiatrist told you to ignore the voices that they were hallucinations. I said, "Well, how's how's that working for you?" He said, "It's not." He's it like, Bad. "They get louder." <laughs> yeah. So I started asking the rest of them. I said, "What happens when you ignore the voices?" Every single one of them said they get louder. They will not be ignored. Yeah, my advice for uh, young men for getting off pornography, because I think pornography festers voices too is they got to get yeah. into something else. Like you can't just not do something like the negative. You can't just exist in a negative. Like you can't be like, okay, I'm not going to watch porn anymore. You're just like, and then you just start what you got to start watching something else. You know, like you have to put your attention somewhere else. Like when I, uh, it's the same with like alcohol. It's like get really into kombucha or get really into you know, something else or else it's just going to come back. Like, that's why they want you bored, isolated, depressed, because you won't be able to quit. There's no way. That's why I got into yeah, exactly. like moon landing See, videos. Well, they want you stuck <laughs> in physical reality and not paying attention to the spirit. Yeah. You know, porn does that. You're stuck in physical reality. Yeah. You're not paying attention to spirit. You know, it's the same thing with, with crime, you know, it's stealing money, stealing physical objects they want you fixated on the physical so you don't have time to think about the spiritual yeah and i see that and in entertainment too like all that all the uh, comics that lied for money i'm like what do you get with the money you get four cars like you but you're losing your spark like it's almost like that little uh that and sorry for cutting you off with zoom i'm like slightly autistic because i can't read when people <laughs> you know but anyway it's like you lose that ability to have intuition when you do sin for money and they want that. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. They want that intuition st stamped out and they don't want you to have it. You know, so, you know, and then the psychiatric mafia is going, yeah, it's your, it's your fault. Your brain is broken. You know, no mention of spirituality, no mention of energetics. 
your brain is broken. Here, we got some pills. So you, you don't even have to work. You just take <laughs> these pills, you know. And, and so they, here they're getting these people reliant on pills and even kids now. They've got tens of thousands of kids on psychiatric drugs now. They have no moral compass whatsoever. None. You know, any psych any depressant, I think any psychotic sales, 15.5 billion by 2022. You know, I mean, it's money, money, money. Yeah. And money is just the physical manifestation of energy. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. th and that's why, cause they create the money. Like some people I've had, uh, talks with people about that where it's like, Oh, they all want money. I'm like, they want your energy. They want your consent. They want, because they created money. I think these demonic elements, these demonic entities were back in like Babylon, man. I think that they figured out how to put like runes on a piece of paper to get man to kill his neighbor. Like we're talking about some deep ass mythology. You know what I mean? Coddington, give me the super chat. I'm sure a lot of people have uh, questions for Jerry and I'm, uh, I can geek out and, uh, and talk too much. I mean, I'm really trying to work on not talking too much, but it's not out of disrespect. It's because I'm so pumped to talk to you about all this stuff. <laughs> and there's always this weird delay on Zoom. So I can never, like, I can never tell, like, you know, like when you're in person, you know when to talk and when not to. But like on the internet, sometimes it's, uh, there's like almost like an autism to it. I don't know. Well, you, you, look at, you look at these guys who are dishing out these drugs that we're talking about. You know, according to the journal American, American Medical Association, the suicide rate for psychologists or psychiatrists is five point times, 5.9 times that of the general population. So they kill the, they, these are the high priests of mental health in the Western world. They kill themselves at a rate 5.9 times that of the general population. Unreal. The, the Journal of uh, Clinical Psychiatry in August 1980 did a five-year study of 18,730 consecutive physician deaths by suicide and found that psychiatrists suicide regularly, year by year, at rates of more than twice that expected. And the diff difference was statistically significant. So they have a, a, they have a, a suicide rate of three to five times higher than most other doctors. Okay. They're assaulted at a rate higher than most other doctors. Okay. The assault rate for other doctors is 16.2 per thousand. You know, <clears throat> the assault rate for psychiatrists is 5.9 times that of the general population. Okay. These are the people who run the Western mental health system. You know, if you were, you would look at it, at the stability of a population. And you look at their suicide rate, that says a lot. And their assault rate. You know, they're, they're, they see that these drugs that they're dishing out to people don't help anybody. They just, they're, they're like Band-Aids. They just merely suppress the symptoms. They don't cure anything. They know that. But they're making a, they're making a fortune. And the side effects are, are awful. They're just absolutely awful. I got a question for you. So Fasting Bear asks, can you ask Jerry if he thinks exercising helps work out the demon voices, exorcist equal exercise, work out the demons? In my experience, people always feel better and happier when they have a steady exercise routine. Yeah, that, that would help, but they don't want you to do that. They don't want you to feel better. They don't want you to exercise. So they'll come up with all kinds of excuses. Oh, well, it's bad weather or... Uh, you, don't you have something else to do or, you know, the, hey, why don't you do this instead? I mean, they'll talk you out of it. They don't want you exercising. You know? And, and they're, they're parasites. You know? They are parasites. They, they drain your energy. So what they have to do is keep you down to a low level of, of thought, you know, negative thought. And you, you can even test that out with strength testing. I mean, put your arms straight out. You know, think a positive thought and have somebody push your arm down. It'll, it'll hold its strength. Then think the worst thing that ever happened to you, boom, and you lose your strength. So they're feeding off of all of us. You know, every negative thought they put in your head, if you buy into it, that's energy that goes from, to them. Because your, your energy flows 
with where you put your attention. And if you put your attention on negative stuff, that's where your energy flows. That's where it goes. In the prisons, did you see very many white collar uh, people, like uh, banker types that were, uh, you know, categorized as schizophrenic that have been like succumbed to those voices? Or was it mostly uh, petty crime? Well, it wasn't petty crimes, but the bankers usually end up in federal prison. I was working in a large state prison. Oh, yeah, 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 totally. Because I'd be curious what their voices sound like. Like the more, like the more uh, non-violent voices. Because they, I think that those people can get influenced to do some pretty heinous stuff too. But a lot of people, oh, yeah. yeah, they don't view it as uh, as criminal because it isn't as like scary and dramatic. But if you think about how m- many people are affected by these economic financial crimes, it's you know, like those high level demons can inflict way more suffering when they get into that level. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the turning of, you know, what they do is they turn normal behavior into disorders. Okay. So this, this psychiatric Bible they have, you know, all the way through college and graduate school and the PhD program, they just worshipped that DS. Yeah, I lost your audio. Are you still there? Check one, check two. Can you, I can't hear you right now. Check one. That's weird. That's a little. How about now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got your back. Nice. Yeah, that's not unusual for stuff like that to happen. Dude, it's so I've had that happen when I when I'm having an interview with somebody and things are getting really productive, there's like an electronic attack. I've seen that many times. That's oh, I have too. It's almost on you. It's it's almost unusual if it doesn't happen. Isn't that crazy? It's like that's crazy. You can have you the can have a could... talk about how great drinking and porn is for eight hours and nothing ever happens. The minute you start really getting to the bottom, I've seen it. I've seen like, like it start glitching and start like things happen that make no sense, but yet I could watch a Disney movie. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Happens, like it, like it just turn- almost, almost every time. Yeah. Like, yeah. so, so when you saw the physical manifestation in that prison that one time with like the sound of crackling, can you explain yeah. that? <laughs> I just experienced it. So what was happening is I, I was, I was, um, finding these patterns okay so what i do is i i give these prisoners i was working with and it, and i could work with them in the prison because when when the psychiatrist at the state hospital found out i was asking these patients about what their voices were telling them i ended up on the red carpet on the, in their office being ordered not to ask questions about the voices Whoa. they told me they are hallucinations what you're doing by asking questions is you're reinforcing the hallucinations and making the patient worse. They had no evidence for that whatsoever. Who knows where the hell that came from? Right. They just made it up. Exactly. And I knew better. I mean, I knew better. Yeah, where you know, did that thought come to, from? You, like, where did their thought come from for that? Did I just lost your audio again? They turned out, they turned off the audio. I can't hear you again. Do you guys, what, what was the button you hit? Check one, check two. They keep knocking at the ports. That's whole dude. Okay, so. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, this is wild. Yeah, they, they, they keep wiping out the ports. You know, so <laughs> what I was doing was finding all these patterns and, you know, seeing that they were patterns. Now I couldn't I couldn't experiment that much at the state hospital because the unwritten rule there was don't do anything to upset psychotics because you never know what they're going to do, and they were beating up psychiatrists at a horrendous rate, so they didn't want anybody messing with them. You know they were I think they were afraid of them. In the prison, the whole prison is built to deal with that kind of stuff. They're not afraid of violence. They're not afraid of people getting angry. They're not they're they're set up to deal with it. So. If a prisoner, if I was working with a prisoner asking what his voices were saying, and he went up to the warden and started complaining, oh, the psychologist is uh, asking me uh, all these questions I don't like about my voices. So the, the, the <laughs> warden would just go, get out of my face, fool. Yeah. <laughs> go, go, play, 
go play in the prison yard somewhere. You know, <laughs> they, they, they didn't, they didn't care until these guys started recovering. When they started recovering and the schizophrenia was gone, then the shit hit the fan. They didn't like that at all. They went after me with like, you know, they went after me with knives at that point. But prior to that, your question was um, the, the, the crackling, okay? So here, here I'm collecting all this evidence. And it, it, was, it was overwhelming evidence that these voices were not hallucinations. But I didn't want to believe it. I mean, I just didn't want to. I, I just lost the audio again. Your audio just went out. <laughs> these fuckers, man. These little right. fuckers. That's crazy. I don't, how about now? Now you're back. You're back. They're just being annoying. Oh, All right. So tell they about are. the crackling. Yeah. Okay. So um, where was I? Oh, that, the, the patterns. Yeah. Okay, and they, so want our, I, they want focus. They want us distracted. That's, dude, it's wild. Yeah. They, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so I was finding all these patterns. Okay. And, and it was like, okay, if, if they're running patterns, they can't be hallucinations. You know, it, it, it's, it, so it was like, that was rational, but I still didn't want to believe it. You know, I didn't want to believe these things were, were demons and I was surrounded by demons and I was speaking to people full of demons and it just, I, I just want to deal with that. So, um, let me see what was the first thing that happened. One of the, one of the patients I was working with, uh, who was, who was doing good. He was, he was getting slowly getting better. He turns around in my doorway one day after a session and he looks at me and he goes, you know, what you're doing is dangerous, don't you? And he just looks at me and then he turns Whoa. around and walks out and I'm just looking at him like, where'd that come from? You know, I, I didn't say anything and he just turned around and left. And I'm like, I didn't just blow that out. You know, I didn't just forget it. I mean, I made a note of it in the back of my head, but I'm thinking, well, these voices are in their heads. They're not in my head. You know, they can't get me because they're, they're, you know, energetic they're spiritual suckers of some kind you know or or either that or they're a part of the guy's subconscious mind i i just didn't want to believe that they were demons okay so let me see what the next thing that happened was um same guy comes back a couple of weeks later without a pass you know, he, he, I don't know how he got into the medical unit without a pass, but he did it. He knocked on my door and, and he goes, uh, the voices want to talk to you. And I'm like, they want to talk to me. That never happened before. It was always, I was the intermediary The, you know, the, the patient would tell me what the voices said all the time. He, the, they were the interpreter. They were the ones telling me. And then if I had anything to say back to the voices, like go stick your head in the toilet or something like that, I would tell them to tell the voices. So like it, it was never a direct communication or it always went through the client, you know, the, the patient. So this time he said, they want to talk to you. And I'm, I'm like, they want to talk to me directly. He goes, yeah, they want to talk to you directly. That had never happened before. Like in, in 25 years, that had never happened before. So I said, come on in, you know, closed the door, sat him down. And I said, uh, okay, what do they have to say? And these words came out of his mouth. You have no right to interfere with our way of life. And it, that was it. Boom. <laughs> my my uh, denial system just crumbled. <laughs> It, it was it was just hanging on by band-aids and, and shoelaces <laughs> and stuff to begin with. That did it. It collapsed. It collapsed right there. It was like these things are entities. These are negative entities of some kind. Principalities you know? of and darkness. I I wasn't sure what kind of entities they were. I just was that that was the breaking point where I realized that wasn't the that wasn't the patient. That wasn't the person. And and right away, as soon as he said that, he goes, that wasn't me. That was them. 
No, I mean, that's in the Bible. Those weren't my words. In the Bible, it says our battle is not flesh and blood. It's principalities of darkness. So it's like. That's exactly. It's like that's what that's what they are. They're they're principalities of darkness. Right. Whoa. And then what happened? I don't want to interrupt. I I, I went into shock. You know, I, I, I he left. I closed my office and I just didn't see anybody for the rest of the day. I was just kind of my mind was blown. It was like. I was in, in in shock. You know, it was like that was a that was a warning shot being fired across my bow. You know, and it was like, you know, where is this going? You know, what are these things? What are they capable of? I didn't know. I had no idea. I could see what they were doing to these people, but I had no idea if they could act toward others outside of the schizophrenic themselves. I I, I didn't think they could. You know, so I went on with this guy and he's, he's getting better and better. And, um, I would also, I'd be asking these guys all kinds of questions. I mean, I was just hammering them questions all the time. What do the voices think about this? How do they react to this? How do, what do they do when you go to church? What do they do when you read the book? You know, what, how the, how they behaved. And, uh, you know, I was getting more and more patterns. So then after a while, I'm, I'm like, uh, thinking, okay, what what would happen if I started screwing up these patterns? What if I what if I started throwing monkey wrenches in the patterns? You know, that's when this guy came in and said, with that voice saying, "You have no right to interfere with our way of life." Okay. Now I didn't stop seeing him, and I didn't stop seeing other other clients or questioning them at the time. Uh, but you know, I, I was aware that they were parasites and that they were draining these guys. So. One day I was reading a book called uh, The Voice of Knowledge by a shaman called Miguel Ruiz. And he was talking about these things, about how they were um, uh, energetic vampires. They were, they were parasites, energetic parasites. And I'd already seen that. You know, I saw the truth of it because I, I saw so many. I mean, some of these, these prisoners were so drained by, by suffering from their voices all night that they couldn't even get up in the morning to eat breakfast. They, they described it as like working out in the hot sun all day with a pickaxe. That's how drained they were after a night of being attacked by these voices. You know? So I was thinking, well, it's because of the bad, bad things that they're telling them all the time. You know, I found out that that wasn't true. It wasn't just the bad stuff. So um, I brought this book in that we're talking about them being parasites. And, uh, well, before that happened, I had an incident in the, I was assigned to, I, I was always assigned to the, the, the worst units in the prison, the, the most violent, the nastiest ones, but that was okay with me because I'm an adrenaline junkie. Yeah. yeah, or yeah. I was, I was more of one then. That's why I was so laughing me, reading your biography. I'm like, I'm like, this dude has no problem with danger, <laughs> you know? And like, it's even in uh, those situations. Cause I have that, uh, that character trait too, where it's like, you have no interest or you have no ability to interfere with our, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. Like my first instinct is like interesting versus like the fear response that they always want, you know? And so I'm like you, I just be like, man, I'm going to learn more shit about this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, that's what I was doing. I didn't, yeah. I didn't stop. Yeah. But one of the, the breaking point with the you know, with the energy drain. I mean, they are they are spiritual vampires. They do drain the person that they affect. You know, they drain us all to different degrees. Yeah. I mean, you know, they 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 would drain us down to the bear if they were able to. Okay. So I was at the I walked in one day to my office and uh here here's a letter, an inmate letter from one of the prisoners in the central detention unit, which was the jail for the prison. So from the whole prison conflict, the people who got in trouble in all these other units would be sent to this jail. So it was like the worst of the worst would go to this place, you know, and I was in charge of providing psych services to that place. And um, so here's this, this inmate letter on my desk came in the, sometime during that night and I read it and it was this, this guy who says, I'm locked in my cell. And these are like little 10 by cell, 10 cells. 
I'm locked in my cell with this psychotic lunatic, and he's he's up all night pacing the floor, talking to himself or somebody, and I wake up and he's standing, leering over me at three in the morning, just standing there looking down at me. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know why he's in prison. I don't know what he's capable of. Please come and help me out. So I go to the computer, pull up his name and his record, and he was there in the in the CDU for protective custody. What he did is he snitched off one of the drug gangs, the the uh, Aryan mafia. He snitched off one of their drug uh, drug deals, and the prison confiscated all their drugs. They broke up the gang. They sent the gang members to different prisons all over the state. And boy, they wanted this guy dead. They'd already stabbed him once. He was in the he was in the CDU for protective custody. That's why he was there, not because he he'd done anything bad. But then they they put in this uh, psychotic guy in there with him. So uh, I go over there and pull out the this guy first, uh, the the guy who not not crazy. And I'm watching him come up the steps, and he had plenty of energy. He didn't use the guard whale. He walked briskly over to the interview room by the control, uh, by the control center, and sat down. And he was he was anxious, you know, he was nervous, but he, he didn't lack energy. I mean, his speech was coherent. It was, it was organized. It, it it flowed. I mean, he he had plenty of energy. He was sitting up. He, you know, he was animated. Um, he had plenty of energy. So after I was done with him, uh, he told me about what it was like living with this guy. And he goes, please help me. Let him go back to the cell and brought up the, guy, the psychotic guy and watched him come up the steps. He just dragged himself up the steps. He had to use the guard the guard whale. He kind of shuffled over into the interview room. He sat down and he just kind of slumped down. No energy whatsoever. And I asked him, are you hearing voices? He goes, yeah, I'm hearing them all the time. I said, uh, are, are you drained of energy? He said, yeah, I'm drained of energy. Um, so what I was thinking was that that energy drain, you know, I thought this for like 15 years, that energy drain was due to all the bad crap that these voices were telling these guys 24 hours a day, right? But this was a perfect experimental situation. They were in the, these two guys were in the same cell, eating the same food on the same cell block, with the same guards, you know, with the same routines, you, you couldn't have a, a, a any better experimental situation, you know. And this guy didn't have any energy, and the guy who was under more stress than you can imagine. I mean, you'd have to be in a war to be under more stress than this guy, because the, they wanted him dead so bad that some of the gangsters got in trouble on purpose to get locked into this unit, and they were shooting messages under his door saying we're here we're waiting to kill you first chance we get you're done we're here we're outside your door we're on this unit you know and he's locked in there with this he's already been stabbed once he's locked in there with this flaming psychotic who's standing over him three in the morning staring down at him you can't be under more stress than that the little 10 by 10 room you know and and yet you know this guy had more energy, much more energy than the psychotic guy. So I walked out of that CDU that day going, it's not what the voices are telling these people. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's something else. He wasn't drained. You know, so if it was the, the, the bad stuff all the time, it, it would, there would, there would be a, this guy would be drained and he wasn't. You know, so it's like, okay, it's not the voices. It's not the, it's not the negative thoughts, you know, that, that's doing that. Um, so then I, I was reading this book by Miguel Ruiz, this uh, South American shaman, was talking about these entities that drain energy. Okay? I brought that book into the prison, and I, I, was, I wanted to read that section to this guy, whose voices had told me, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. So I, I brought him in the office, closed the door. I said, I got something I want your opinion on. And I would be asking them their opinion on stuff all the time. And what about this? What about that? What are, how do the voices react here? What do they do under these circumstances? I'm constantly bombarding them with questions. Scores of them, many of them. 
And uh, so I started reading that about the, the voices or these entities being um, vampires draining these people. And I, I, I've kind of finished up and I looked at him and he's just staring at me with this eerie gaze. He, he, you know, he looked like he was out of it. He was just staring at me. And I, I, I asked him, well, what do you think? And he didn't say anything. And then this behind my back, this loud electrical crackling just mm -hmm. exploded. And I'm like going, what in the blazes is that? You know, and I turn around and it's moving toward my, the right-hand wall. And I couldn't see anything, but I could hear it. You know? And it was like crackling up the wall, crack, 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 crack. It, was, it sounded just like an electrical arc welder, you know, just moving up the wall at a 45-degree angle. So I'm, I'm staring at it, seeing where the noise come from. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't smell anything. But I was afraid to take my, my sight off this guy for too long. I, I thought he was going to attack me. He looked really strange. He went into this zombie-like look. So I pushed my chair against the back wall and uh, you know, kind of kept an eye on him, but I was switching my attention between him and this crackling. It crackled all the way to the hand wall. I didn't see anything. I didn't smell anything. I didn't feel anything. And then it starts crackling across the ceiling, you know, and then I could see him and and watch the progression of the crackling too. So it wasn't a short phenomenon. It wasn't like five or ten seconds. This went on for 20, 25 seconds, maybe a half minute. And then it starts crackling down the left-hand wall at a 45-degree angle. I still don't see anything. And I ask him, I said, do you hear that? He doesn't say anything. He's just staring at me with this blank, weird stare. And then it jumps into this Rubbermaid ca trash can by my left leg, and it's crackling in the trash can next to my leg. So I, I l l move over and look down in there. There's nothing there. There's not even a piece of trash there. The inmate porter cleaned it the night before. Nothing was in there except Ugh. this crackling. You know? and, and I'm, like, totally freaked out. And then I'm, I look at him, and he gets, slowly gets up, and he goes, I got to leave. And he shuffles out of the office. And I'm like, go, <laughs> get out of here, you know, be gone, you know. And after that, I, I went and I traced, you know, got up and I, I stood and walked around the office looking for any burn marks or any evidence that this could have happened. There's nobody I could talk to about this kind of stuff. They'd think I was a lunatic, you know. And it, I was starting to think that I was losing my mind. Because you know, I had heard that this guy doesn't answer me, walks out, and uh, then I go out to the uh, out to the hall in the medical unit, and I look at all the other offices. All the doors are locked. The nurses aren't in yet. The doctors aren't in yet. Nobody's there. There's nothing that could have caused this, and there's nobody I could tell about it. You know, I had to keep it to myself. So again, my mind is blown. I mean, it's it's just totally blown. Close the office again. Just sat there wondering, where am I going? Where, where is this going? See, I had no cognitive map of what this is. And what, what scared me was I didn't think these things could affect physical reality. But if they could cause a crackling sound to circumnavigate my office, then they can affect physical reality. And that shook me up more than anything else. So if they could do that, what else could they do? You know? So I was like, where is this going? I had no cognitive map. There was, there was no books I've ever read. There was no psychologist I've ever read that talked about anything like this ever, you know? So it's like, where, where is this going? You know, where, where is it taking me? And I, I was freaked out. You know, so I called him back uh, what was it, three months later, I think, three, four months later. I didn't want to see him again for, for a while. That's how long it took me to kind of overcome the fear of, of this thing. And he came back, uh, gave him a pass to come in. He came back. He looked good. I thought he would be a wreck. You know, he, he looked good. Uh, and I told him, I said, yeah, I thought you'd be a wreck after what happened the last time I saw you. He said, no, I'm doing what you told me. I, you know, I, I haven't lost any ground. You know, I haven't gotten rid of the voices, but I haven't, you know, they haven't taken any more control of me either. And I asked him, I said, uh, did you hear that, that crackling when you were in my office last time? And he goes, yeah. I said, what was that? He said, yeah, I heard it, but I'm surprised you did. He said, that was them. I said, the voices? And he said, yeah, those were the voices. 
And I said, what were they trying to do? He said, well, they were trying to scare you off. And I said, well, they did a damn good job of it. <laughs> it was like, you know, three months later. And I said, you looked really strange when you left the office. What were the voices telling you when, when you were leaving my office? He said, they were telling me to go get a shank and stick it in your gut. And I was going, oh, he wouldn't do that. You know, I worked with him for nine months. He was getting better. He's doing better. He's, you know, he's holding his own now, you know. And I asked him, uh, well, why didn't you do it? And he said, nobody would give me one, and I couldn't find one. So it was then that I realized that these things were, were dangerous. Damn. What happened then? Well, that, like, so what did you do after that? Like, did you, did you have any more encounters with that or did it affect your behavior? Well, I knew these things were dangerous. I didn't stop. I didn't stop trying to help these guys. But one thing strange happened is at some point while I was working at the prison, I got to where I could feel these things. You know, when they were angry, when they were strong, I could feel them. It was, and I don't know where that came from. And it, it feels like this icky electrical feeling. There's no other feeling in life like it. I, I can't, it, the closest I could, I could get is like a cross between like your hair standing up on edge and, and goosebumps. You know, it's, it's this icky electrical feeling. So I could tell when they were getting angry, you know, so it was like a warning. And I could do that when I, when, after I left the prison and was working psych crisis and all these emergency rooms around Tucson, that came in real handy, you know, because uh, these patients would come in off the street. I mean, they were, in a lot of ways, they were more dangerous than the guys in prison because the guys in prison were already settled in. Most of them were on some kind of drug. You know, they were already under control. And there was much more control there than there was in the emergency room. There were no cops in the emergency room. There was no security in the emergency room. These guys were coming in raw, you know, with flaming voices, um, just in off the street. Matter of fact, the cops were dropping them off and leaving. You know? So that feeling uh, helped a lot because I, I could sit these guys down and I could feel these things. And I'd ask, are you hearing voices? And they go, no, I'm not hearing voices. And I could say, yes, you are. And this is how strong they are. And they were shocked. They go, how do you know? Do you hear voices too? You know, I said, no, I don't hear voices. I said, I can feel them. You know. So it, that went on and on and on. Um, and now I couldn't speak out about this stuff while I was working in the prison, you know, because they would go after me. You know. And even after that, when I, I, I had my life, I dropped my license because I know they would go after me. So I just let it elapse. I, I, I didn't, I didn't pay it. I, I just dropped it. And then, uh, and looking for something that actually worked with people, I found the MACE, MACE energy method. It works better than any other psychotherapy I've ever seen in all my years of working. You know, the, this stuff that, they teach in the colleges and, and uh, universities, the, these counseling and psych psychology. There wasn't anything, you know, I, I had an undergraduate psychology and then two years in the PhD program and, and, you know, some psychology in the counseling program. None of that served any practical purpose on the front lines working with these people except for the DSM. Yeah, it did. It got you, you know, in debt so that you financially couldn't question anybody. <laughs> Look, that's the whole right. point. The whole point. So, I think so, the point of BA, when they say you have to have a BA to be a cop, is, is basically like indentured servitude. Like, you have to be in debt so that when we say make you do something you don't want to, you don't question it. I really think it's like right. a form of slavery. Uh, yeah, well, it's, a, it's brainwashing. It's a form of slavery, you know, yeah. and... You know, you have to jump through their hoops to even gain access to a clinical population. You know, if you were to walk up to a prison and go, hey, I want to talk to the schizophrenics, you wouldn't even get past the front gate. Or I want to research schizophrenics. No way. Or if you went into a mental hospital and say, hey, I'd like to talk to some of the schizophrenics, you'd never get in. Or even a mental health center. You know, they will not allow researchers in there. All this garbage that's coming out is coming out from the universities. 
who who are controlled by big pharma and the psychiatric mafia, you know, making their $14.7 billion a year. They're not being done by real researchers, you know, and, and the ones, the real researchers who are trying to do something are, are not getting their articles published. Anything that interferes with their $14.7 billion. The only thing useful, really useful that I found, except for maybe uh, experimental psychology and, and some counseling techniques, you know, basic counseling techniques, the, was the DSM, because this Diagnostic and Statistical Mental, mental Disorders is their Bible. That's what they label all this stuff with. That's how they communicate with each other. They've got this big, thick book with close to 300 mental disorders and classifications of mental disorders that they want you to memorize. You know? And they keep and changing it, it. And it's made up. Yeah, the they change it all the time. Made up. Yeah. Like, imagine if you memorize the, the like, if you memorize the last one, it doesn't even do you any good because they're like, oh, we just changed it. Now chopping off your dick is, like, healthy. And you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> that was one of the craziest yeah. moves, man, is when they, when they said that people that chop off their own penis are, uh, are totally fine. Like, in criticizing that, means you're the one filled with hate. Like, don't you kind of feel like, cause I know it, it does appear like it's getting worse, but don't you almost feel like they went so far that there is like a counter movement happening because like after COVID, like people aren't trusting the science or academia like they used to. I think they lost a lot of that I brand. Think they did too. Yeah. And I think that, I think they, cause like the demon, like the, the, the entities, they always go too far. They always like, they don't have an ability to be happy, you know? So they no. always have to go until it breaks. And they're I think it's happy it broke. when they make people miserable. Yeah, That's when exactly. Happy. Yeah, yeah. So what came out of the, all the, the main thing that came out of all this education was this diagnostic statistical manual that they communicate with each other through this. Oh, this guy has uh, bipolar. This guy's uh, schizophrenic. This guy's schizoaffective. This guy's neurotic. What, you know, this is these labels. What they've done is they've taken segments of human behavior and they've pathologized it. Okay, that 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 DSM is a complete work of fiction. They've made all these things up. They broke human behavior up and pathologized it. Every single one of the more than 296 psychiatric disorders in the DSM-5 and later have been completely made up by a group of psychiatrists, two thirds of which are in cahoots with the, the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, and it's, it's okay. never the system's fault. It's always the individual's no. fault. That's the definition of gaslighting. So it's like during the COVID thing, if you're isolated, locked down, you have a mask on your face, like you don't even treat people in Guantanamo like that. But yet they got people to do this to each other. And if you had any like mental problems or emotional problems, it's because you're pathological and you need pills. It's like, right. You know, yeah. it, and the isolation, the isolation was devastating. Dude, that's people why like during to be isolated. Well, that while that was happening. I never, I didn't fall for a single element of that. And I was act actually actively, um, you know, crowdsourcing a way where we could buy a little plot of land and have meetups, barbecues, family get togethers. Cause I knew that I was watching people not attend their father's, uh, their father's yeah. funeral. And I'm going to tell you something interesting that happened to me. So I did a pretty minor and basic uh, crowdfund so that we could, as a community, buy a little piece of land and have events on it. I received more backlash. Like you'd think that I just shot a guy in public, the media, like the uh, daily, uh, daily, uh, mail yeah. and, and the beast, the daily beast, like they even named them accurately. You know, they were doing these huge hit pieces on me. Banks were like freaking out, kicked off PayPal, kicked off these crowdfunding sites where you could crowdfund anything. But yet if you, if I, during COVID, if you attempted to crowdfund something that would break isolation from people, there was an organized worldwide insane reaction that I still deal with today from these people because it was so effective. Like they wanted people alone. They wanted people yeah. afraid. Yep. 
And so if yep. you're actively trying to do uh, the, the solution, which is, okay, let's not be afraid. Let's have get togethers. Let's form our communities. Like I tell my community, no 10 people within 10 miles. Persistence is fertile. You know, like uh, I, I try to have these little catchphrases to like family is wealth, money is debt. Like it actually is a counteraction to those plans because if you have community, if you have family, if you have get togethers, if your fear level's low, it, it doesn't work on you. And so, right. Yeah. And so like, and I've been very, I, I mean, I've been very front lines about breaking that. And because of that, you'd think if you, I don't know if you Googled me, but you'd think that I was like, you know, that I was this like evil guy. And it's like, I've had a few uh, parking tickets. I've had a couple speeding tickets. I have a very successful marriage, a lot of kids. I'm like, everyone who knows me likes me. But you'd think that they found like a serial killer. They're like, oh, Owen Benjamin is full of hate. He's full of just disinformation. He wants people dead. He was like, they're like calling me like a murderer because I was telling people not to take the vaccine. I'm like, and like my skill level is rhetoric with I comedy. I ran into the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, uh, don't take medical advice from people that get awards for population reduction. Like I'll, I'll come up with these little things that spread. And that's why they fucking hate me because it's like, it's so obvious when you see it. If you have someone that gets an award for lowering the population, why would you take an experimental medical thing from them? Like, just right. think about it. And they and stand the reason. Exactly. And I'm not even saying like what to do. I'm just, I'm just saying that that's something to think about. And they were like, Oh, and Benjamin. but the thing about the demons is it's short term. Like they can, with the crackling sound or with, you know, the way they come at you, if you react like prey, it works. But if you don't, it yes. actually reveals more about them. That's why they, I think it's risky right. for them to do that. Like, I think when they crackled on you like that, and you didn't stop, you actually got another sense to feel them. And I think that's why it's like balanced where it's like, because on your timeline, what you were just telling me. So, so you have this crackling event. They are breaking that covenant of like, we're now going to try and scare you in your life, even though you don't accept the demon or accept the entities. Okay. If you run, if you're full of fear, then it worked. But if you don't, now you can feel it. And now it's almost like you got another weapon against them. And that's why, you know, like these demons. It, 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 it was like, it was like a warning, you know, because yeah. some of these guys are so unstable. I could feel when they were, you know, were, when they were approaching their explosion point. So it was like whatever that was, was sent to me for that. And that, that helped a lot. It did. It helped you. Know, you. It like, that's why they can't just lot. do it. Like you. It's the same thing with like when, when me and some of the guys I work with, we'll see their tactics. And if we don't react, we're like, it, it's where a lot of knowledge comes from. Cause these entities have profound, deep and old knowledge. They just use it badly. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. The other thing that helped a lot, I mean, I, I can't under, I can't underestimate this was being an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> that that helped so much, you know, with this. Uh, you know, because there were times where I was scared shitless, really. I mean, I was I was terrified. But you didn't I mean, stop, just, though, which is what no, matters. I didn't stop. Yeah, I, I didn't stop. But uh, yeah, if, awesome. talking about this DSM, this this Bible they have, where they they've they've created all these mental disorders. They made them up out of out of nothing. You know, that, and, and they're growing every year. So in 1952, the DSM had 106 psychiatric disorders. By 1980, there were 256. So here they are making these things up, going, oh, well, which ones can we treat with these drugs? We'll come up with some kind of drug to treat these things. You know, and then they put them in there. So they vote them in and they vote them out. You know, so if they don't like them or they're getting too much flack for them, they'll vote them out. You know, so the, it, I, I've heard it's like a tobacco barn. They they go in, they all have this meeting, they come together, and guy, go, hey, I I got a new mental disorder here. It's this and this, and this is how it works, and this is the African, and they all mull it over and decide whether they're going to add it because they have to use these diagnoses for insurance. 
They use it to communicate with each other and for insurance. And it's always so coincidental, isn't it? It's like, we just think though, where it's like, it's always, it's always coincidentally what serves them, you know? I was, yeah. 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 So yeah, not one of these 297, there's 297 of them now. Nice. They just keep making more and more every year. <laughs> not one of those mental disorders has a defining diagnostic. But this, ladies and gentlemen, one second. That, you guys understand why I get pissed off when people say use the Ethernet cable? Because you, you don't even know what you're talking about. You know, this is on a this is on a different level of technical problems. <laughs> All right, give me one second here, ladies and gentlemen. Gen ladies and gentlemen, entities are pissed. Oh, pissed, pissed. Check one, check two. And people are going to go, just get an Ethernet cable. All right, as long as I'm waiting for Jerry to come back, I just sent him another invite. Uh, Codsworth, do you mind giving me the, uh, the uh, Super Chats? And don't forget, if you're enjoying the stream, entropystream.live slash app. So I show him. Oh, here's Jerry. Sweet. Is Jerry back? Yeah, it looks like they... It looks like they knocked us completely off the air that time. Dude, how crazy is that? And here's the thing. I, sometimes I get really pissed off at people. If I'm just like crushing really hard and that happens, um, they're just like, oh, get an Ethernet cable. I'm like, my, my Internet is literally as fast as you can possibly get it. You know, it's pretty funny. All right. Well, we were talking about these diagnoses. So yeah. But here's, here's, a, here's some of them that are in the DSM now. Okay, this, is, this tells you how far out they go. Mathematics disorder. If you don't like math, <laughs> you don't do good math, you've got a disorder. <laughs> Caffeine intoxication disorder. Hilarious. You drink, too much, you drink too much coffee, you're disordered, man. You're broken. <laughs> Sibling relational disorder. So your kids fighting with each other. Now it's a disorder. Here's it's a, a pill. psychiatric disorder. You want some meth or heroin? <laughs> Yeah, Adderall, Ritalin, oh. <laughs> you know, sexual orientation disturbance. That's homosexuality. Now, you know, get these. Florence syndrome. Being overwhelmed by beauty, such as in Florence, Italy. Symptoms are fainting and dizziness. Treatment <laughs> is antidepressants. That's hysterical, man. Overwhelmed by beauty. Paris syndrome. Mostly Japanese patients visiting France. Symptoms include, <laughs> symptoms include depression, anxiety, feelings of persecution. Dude, do you think they're joking? Like, okay. Do you no, think, no, they're, ser they're dead serious. But do you think the that, demons that are, are, are doing like a deep joke on people? I think that sometimes. Well, these thoughts come from somebody. You know, that Paris syndrome probably would have been called uh, you know, culture shock, you know, in my day. When, when Japanese like, yeah. people go to France, <laughs> antidepressants for beauty. Oh my God, that's so crazy, man. What There's are some no other ones? You got any more? Way of, th these, are all, these are all subjective. There's no scientific way to verify <laughs> any of these. They're all made up. They're all a work of fiction. And they treat it. They tried to turn it into disease. They tried to make it look, oh, yeah, these are diseases. But the, the medical people went, no, they're not. <laughs> you <know? laughs> you're, you're not curing anything. You know, we can't find any evidence of these things. Nobody's ever pulled a, a schizophrenic demon out of the guy's head. Nobody's pulled a thought out of anybody's brain. You know, they don't have any evidence for it. So they didn't let the, the medical system didn't let them get away with turning these things into a, a disease. You know. Dude, Jacob, has, all right. Uh, and I have to ask you one more thing because I know we're, uh, we had a time zone issue. So Jerry was patiently waiting for me when I didn't realize that we weren't on the same time zone. Um, and we've done a good solid two hours. So I'm going to let the man uh, go on with his day. But I do have to ask you about uh, shadow people because some oh, of yeah. our residents, uh, schizophrenics, will talk about, uh, about like shadow people with like green eyes. So what's that all about? Well, I, I don't know exactly what they are, but I've talked to hundreds of schizophrenics and meth addicts. That's where I first, when the prison started filling up with meth addicts, 
Okay. And the, the prisoners called meth the devil's drug. And that's what it is. It is, it's, man. It's one of the most dangerous drugs out there. Now, I've seen more people go psychotic on meth than any other drug. You know, and it starts off where they start using the stuff, they start hearing the voices while they're using it, and they go, oh, that, yeah, that's just a hallucination. Right? And, and they come down and the voices are gone. So they go, well, that proves it's a hallucination. Next time they use it again, they start hearing voices again. They might do that for a month or two, and then one day the voices don't go away. They're there for the rest of their lives, and they're just as psychotic as anybody in the mental health system. They're just anybody locked up on a mental hospital. You know, meth drives people crazy. It's very dangerous. Now, along with that, they were seeing shadow people. So when I heard something like that, I was like you, my ears are like, I'm all ears. Well, tell me about these things. Well, what they said, they were three-dimensional shadows, in the, often in the shape of humans, but not always. Sometimes they had capes, sometimes they had hats, you know. Uh, sometimes they were dressed in different kinds of things, but they were always three-dimensional shadows. They were always darker than the rest of the room. Okay? They never spoke, never said anything. They would just appear at the, in the, uh, with the person, or usually at night, they were darker than the rest of the room. If the, if the patient paid attention to them and kept looking at them, they would start moving toward the patient. And, and I've, never, I've never found a person who stayed put long enough for them to get there. Yeah, I was just going to so, ask, what happens when I, they get to you? I, I only talked to one person who said they felt them walk through them. Whoa. And they said they could actually feel them as they passed through them. Okay. So they, they never say anything. It seems like they just, they're like watching and they just scare people. You know, they, they never, I never heard them, I heard of them hurting anybody. But if you pay attention to them, they move in on you. And then there was one day I was talking to one prisoner who was a meth addict and he said, he was telling me about an experiment he did with a friend of his with the shadow people. So he, they noticed, him and his friend noticed that they... I lost what your they audio. Wanted to oh, know, yeah, your audio's back. Go on. You're good. Yeah. What they wanted to know was, were they seeing the same shadow people or were they seeing individual shadow people individually? It's the same. They, Dude, a cop friend of mine did this experiment... And he's like, they're the same, like they're seeing the same thing. Right. Like, right. like that's he, what these guys, yeah. Think. Like meth heads in my area. One of my buddies who's on the SWAT, he's like, he's like, dude, the craziest shit that got him back into Christianity. He's like, these guys don't want to be bad. They're like, I don't want to do these things. Like they're like, they're like possessed and right. they'll see the same guy as another meth guy. Like it's, so it's not even in their head. Like, multiple guys will be looking at the same guy. And I find that, and he was like, dude, it's crazy. And so now and he's that's just- That's what he found. Yeah. That's what he found out also. Yeah, they went yeah. and did an experiment. They went out to one of the Indian reservations south of here, middle of nowhere at night. And one guy shot up with the meth. He started seeing them. The other guy couldn't. The other guy shot up. Then they're both seeing them. And they found that they were seeing the same ones doing the same thing. So- they were both agreeing that they could see the same ones. Now, he said, uh, <clears throat> remember I said they, they start moving in on you when you pay attention to them? Well, these guys, there was, they started coming in out of the desert and just come moving in on them as a horde. So they jumped in the truck, locked the doors, rolled up the windows, and sat in the truck watching them. And then he said at one point, the back of the truck went down like a giant boulder hit it, and the front of the truck jumped up. They looked in the back of the truck and it was full of these shadow people. So that got my attention too. It's like, I didn't think these things could affect physical reality, but if what he says is true, they can. Now, the only direct experience I had with something that was probably a, a shadow people. See, when, when they start seeing the color of their eyes, the, the color of the eyes on the shadow people are either red or, or lime green. When I talked to a patient who saw their eyes, they were in deeper trouble than people that didn't see their eyes. 
they were much further along the way. They were much further gone. Okay. Then there was one day uh, I was working site crisis in the emergency room of the county hospital at the time. And uh, it was Christmas Eve I got assigned to, to work. And it was a pretty quiet night. And this one guy comes in, he's shaking like a leaf, and just trembling like a leaf. Never stopped shaking. So I, I <clears throat> pulled him in, started finding out what's going on with him. He said he was, he's been a meth addict. And I said, uh, do you, how do you use it? He says he injects it. And I said, how long have you been using, doing that? He said, uh, 10 years. Right away, my ears went up. I mean, he should have been dead five years ago. I don't know why he was still alive. So I was very curious. Started asking him questions. I said, uh, <clears throat> do, you, do you see the shadow people? He goes, yeah, I see them. I asked, did you ever see their eyes? He said, yeah, I see their eyes. They're lime green. You know? So I didn't tell him what color. He knew. And I, I said, have you ever spoken to them? Because I've never spoken to anybody who did. But I, I just asked that because I figured this guy who's been doing meth for 10 years, injecting, and he's still alive, if, if they did talk, he would know about it. Okay? So he goes, yeah, I've spoken to them. I said, well, what did they sound like? And he started describing this. I mean, it, it just gave me shivers just having him describe it. It, it was like you know, running your fingers across a chalkboard. You know, it was this high-pitched, squeaky sound that just gave me shivers just listening to it. I just lost your audio again. I lost your audio. Yeah, it's like a high-pitched whine. It's like, ah, oh, maybe not. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's what they said. So uh, I asked him, well, wh what what did they tell you? What were they talking to you? And as soon as I asked that question, this guy's shiver, his, his shaking. He was shaking the whole time in the office. He was just like this. Stopped. He went dead still. Just dead still. And I'm looking at his eyes, and those weren't his eyes anymore. They were like these deep, dark pools of hatred. Yeah, they get black, I mean, it was too. Like, like, people's eyes can get black. black. Yeah. Yep, they, they were like that. They were just black, you know, wide black pupils. It was like this, this cold hatred like I've never felt in my entire life, just streaming out of him, you know. <clears throat> I lost your audio again. They're fucking... <laughs> The key is just not letting it bother us. Just like, just, no. yeah, they want us to be annoyed. So you can't show fear in that situation. So here I am staring at these these dark eyes. That this guy's just stark still after shivering all night unceasingly. He's stark still, and these eyes are looking at him, and that wasn't him. That was something else, you know. And I could just feel this deep, cold hatred just welling out of there. I've never felt hatred like it in my life from anybody or anything. It was, I, I'll never forget the hatred. It was just this silent, cold hatred just pouring out of those eyes. And then, boom, it just, it just left and he started shaking again. You know, and I'm like, you know, he didn't even realize it happened, I don't think. So I'm like... I needed to know what they said, you know, and I, I was I was pretty shook up. But here's the adrenaline junkie again. Yeah, yeah. You know, how far can you push this without getting your head knocked off? And I said, well, I, I think I got another shot, and one more. <laughs> so I I started asking him. I goes, well, what what did they tell you? What did the what did the shadow people tell you? He said they told me to go out out to the highway and jump in front of a truck. And I said, well, what happened? I said, well, I, I did. He, he, they told me I wouldn't be hurt. So I said, what? Did you do it? He goes, yeah, I did. I jumped in front of a truck, and they, he said I was hit. He said I was thrown off, off the road, off to the side of the road. And he said, when I woke up, the shadow people were standing all around me, telling, <clears throat> telling me, that now I'm getting, now they're getting my throat. They were telling him to get up. He wasn't hurt. And he got up and he said, I wasn't hurt. And I said, well, what happened then? They said, do it again. So he did it again. He was hit again. And um, they, he got up and again, he wasn't hurt. So then I went to ask him another question. And 
I thought better of it. <laughs> I lost your audio again. <laughs> so what happened to the guy? Like, how did that end? Well, I thought about asking him another question. And then I thought better of it. You know, yeah. after that thing came back twice, I'm yeah. like, what's it going to do a third time? So it's like strike three, you're out. I just, I just went, no, okay, go back. Has one I of them ever admitted. attacked you? Is one ever, if you've asked them questions, is it ever like actually, have they actually attacked you? Do you get a lot of threats? Uh, um, well, yeah, the voices were threatening me all the time. You know, but there was a difference between what they were saying and whether the patient was willing to carry out that attack. Okay, so that was that was more an internal gut feeling. You know, uh, I developed that with my dad as a youngster. You know, he was pretty violent, and as a youngster, I, I, I had no way to fight back with him when I was a little kid. So what I would do is just drive him to the verge of exploding and then back off and disappear. And the, the results of blowing the estimation were severe. Yeah, 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 totally. And I, I had plenty of practice at it. So that came in really handy working with psychotics also, especially with the criminally insane. I could feel how far I could push them. And I was able to get more information out of them than any of my colleagues because I could, I could feel their, their breaking point, just like I did with my dad. Yeah. And, and that was another thing with, with that kind of abuse. You know, I'd show up there and, and they would start their crap and I'd go, what else you got? You know, it was, it was nothing I wasn't unfamiliar with. Yeah, yeah, I have the same thing. I had an uh, interesting relationship with my dad too and it, it kind of equipped me to... Uh, to deal with psychotic people. Like I'm like, I know if I get on my knees, I'm never getting up. So fuck you. You know, <laughs> like I know yeah. not to, not to have a fear response to, uh, to like, uh, these type of mind games and it's all from insecurity, right. weakness, all that. But it's just like, it's kind of like an animal trainer when you're dealing with a vicious animal, like you can't turn and run or else they'll just instinctively right. come. So right, exactly. Yeah. And so that's why it's like, you know, those type of upbringings can actually prepare you for that demonic realm. And they, yep. And it, and it did. So the, I had one girl turned out she'd murdered somebody. She was psychotic when uh, she came in and I was talking to her about the voices and I knew what, what happens is when you tell the patient that the voices are um, parasites, that they're sucking their energy. The voices get extremely angry and agitated. You know? But in the ER, that's probably the most critical piece of information I could give them because they didn't want you working with people in the emergency room. They wanted you getting them out. They wanted you sending them get out of the emergency room so they could put medical patients in there, send them to a mental health center, send them home, admit them to the psych hospital, but get them out of the emergency room. That was the job. You know, and, you know, I wanted to work. I wanted to help people. I didn't want to just push them out of there. You know, so if I could tell them the voices were parasites and point out how they felt before and after the voices came, that was probably the, the most significant thing I could do for them at that time, besides giving them that's a lie program. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so there was one gal where I knew she was, she was very agitated. I knew she could comprehend that information. And I told her, I said, are you, are you hearing the voices now? And she said, no. I said, well, well, you will be in about 60 seconds. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move away from the door. If you need to leave, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to get you in trouble. Just walk out of, the, out of, the, out of the, my office, you know, run out of the office, and, and then go to the bathroom or do something else. I'll catch up with you later. Okay. So I went to tell her about the... Uh, voices being parasites and she just bolted out of there she ran out of there ran across the day room ran to the bathroom couldn't get into the bathroom and started running around the day room like a, a like a lunatic you know and the, the the psych nurse you know came up and said well what'd you do to her i said that she, she'll be all right just leave her be she'll she'll calm down so you know about four minutes later she came back in so 
I would just tell them, I'm not going to stand in your way. You know, I'd always leave the door open if they ne needed to leave. I never turned my back to them in the office ever. That's uh, good. You offload and, uh, that energy where if thing, cause like a cornered parasite, as long as you give them a way out, like the demon will seek like the least resistance, like almost like electricity. It's crazy, right? They'll like try yeah, and they'll, I, they'll go that way. But if you corner them and you don't let them out, you know, and you show fear and stuff, then they'll come at you, you know? Yeah. I told them all, you know, you're, you don't have to stay here if you can't handle it. Yeah. 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 You know, That's great. Well, go leave, leave and I'll get you later. So I, I, a number of my colleagues were hurt over time. There was one, they, they beat him almost to a pulp. He had to be hospitalized. Whoa. You know, and that sucker didn't fight back. He didn't fight back. He just curled up into a ball and let the psychotic guy kick the shit out of him. Yeah. The, the demon amazing. probably smelled that, you know, where it's like, yeah. they smell weakness. They do. Yeah. Yeah. That's I why some people right. that get victimized over and over again, like you'll have the same people have horrible things happen to them over and over again. I think there is like right. a demeanor that they're giving off. It's kind of like if you're hunting rabbits or something like that, right. there's like a certain way that one will act and, and you go for that one, you know? And I, cause the demons, I think the, the entities I think are predator. They're like predatory. They're like parasitic, they but predatory. Like they, they'll look at your weaknesses, kind of like how a human will hunt and they'll like, and they'll try and get in there. And if they can't, you know, they, they, you know, they just, they can't, it is what it is. Super interesting, man. How does it affect your life? Cause I mean, you've brought their existence to a tremendous a lot of, amount of people, which makes you a target in that realm. Have you seen people in public look at you weird or is there any kind of like, a oh, I haven't thought that, but they almost killed me once. How? I was down in Mexico. I was down in Mexico <clears throat> and I went to bed. I was with a friend. We were at a, at a resort kind of thing. And I went to bed normally, woke up in the morning. And this was, um, this was like two weeks before I was going on one of the biggest interviews. Um, I forgot the, 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 the fellow's name. But one of the biggest interviews I've ever been on. Okay. Woke up in the morning. I couldn't move my arm. It was just extremely painful. You know? And then... I hung with it and it, it was getting worse and worse and worse until finally I had to tell my friend, I need to get back. I need to get back to Tucson. I'm not going to a Mexican hospital. You know? um, so finally I got him to agree to leave. Went to the emergency room that night. <clears throat> they admitted me immediately what had happened. And I'd never heard of this before. They said a staph infection exploded in my right shoulder. Okay. So ended up being operated on that next morning. And I, I was on antibiotic, IV antibiotic drugs for months after that. So it knocked me out of that interview. But th this fellow waited for me, you know, and when, when I had enough energy to go back on, I was on. The second biggest thing they did is they took my, my son. Oh. He's psychotic as a bed bug. He doesn't listen to anything I say. I could help him. I could help him tremendously. He won't listen to anything. He's totally out of control. Oh, man. How old is he? He's 30, 32. He doesn't listen to anything. He won't take any advice. He can't work. He's in bad shape. Brutal, man. Sorry to hear that. Do you have One other the, kids? Uh, he's the only one. Fuck. Yep. I'm you know, paying a big price. Jesus. I, do, they, do they like uh, try and get people to threaten you a lot? No. That's good. Not, not really. I, I haven't got a lot of threats, which is interesting. I, th I thought for sure I probably would get, but I haven't. That's good. Fuck, man. Is there any, like, so with your son, is there any treatment for him? Is there anything that he just won't? He won't go. He won't go. He won't listen to anything I or my wife have to say. Has he always been like that? He's always pretty much been like that, but it's worse now. I mean, he's virtually homeless now in, a, in another city. Ugh. 
And we can't do anything to help him because he won't listen to anything we say. I'm sorry to hear that, man. That's brutal. I'm sorry to have experienced it. Man, so what else is going that's on? A, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, that's it. That's that. That's the price they extracted from me. Yeah. Oh man. How's your wife handling it? Not well. Not well at all. Jesus. See, I could help him, but he won't listen. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I could, I could probably pull him out of it. He won't listen. He won't listen to anything I say. Nothing. Zero. I mean, the ironies of life, man. Like one of the the biggest experts at exactly the thing that he's plagued with, and he won't listen. Fuck. Does he have drug problems? No, I think meth was. He he returned to meth for a short while, and I think that's what broke him. That's where, you know, he was, he had drug problems. He was doing good for years. And then he ran into all these stressors. And then, boom, he, he used meth. And that's, that's when they jumped in there. They jumped in with both feet after he did that. Do you think that there is a uh, nefarious plot with the uh, pushing of all of these psychedelic drugs at this point? Because there, there's a, a major push for psychedelic drugs now. Like, it, it appears like a lot of people are seeing, you know, like DMT and ayahuasca and all this stuff. Like, I do you think that that's a way to open the door for these entities? I think it can. You know, yeah. I've, I've spoken to some people who took ayahuasca and they said, well, it was great. It worked wonderful. And there's some others. I mean, I did an interview with one. I have him on uh, on my my channel at jerrymarzinski.com where he was doing psychedelic drugs and an entity entered him and it's, it's now sharing his consciousness with him. So it's, it's a very interesting, uh, I forgot what his name was. Um, yeah. I listened to that interview. It was like, he was talking about how it was affecting his arm. I, I, I was like, fuck. Right. Yeah. That's him. Yeah. That's yeah. It is so, like a two way street. Cause I have heard people say that it helped their, their mental problems. And I've also heard people say that like it opened up a door that they wish was not open. So yeah. Well, I know without, with alcohol, there's this particular spirit associated with alcohol. Dude, that's why it's called gin. It's a spirit called gin. Like you drink gin. Yeah. What, well, that what makes sense? Did your dad drink? Is that when he would get violent? No, but he, he got misdiagnosed and they put him on um, a form of amphetamine. So he actually got crazy for a while. Yeah. So I was used to living with it. You know, it's like I wasn't, it, it, it didn't come as a shock to me when I started, you know, in, in the mental hospital dealing with crazy people. Yeah. What is the alcohol spirit? What is that? Well, it, you can talk to alcoholics and, uh, or the wives of family of alcoholics and they will tell you, you know, Hey, he's not the same. I could see he changes as a person yeah. when he gets drunk. And when you're hung over, so the, when you're hung over, you're also off. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's a, I, I talked to a number of people who could actually see these spirits enter drunk people. So th these are, these are earthbound spirits who are alcoholics. They can't get drunk in their spiritual form. So what they got to do is they got to jump into somebody drinking. Yeah. yeah and yeah, then yeah. they can, then they can get high. It's like so that with sex they, too. Yeah, same thing. And and notice again, it's it's all physical, physical, physical. So if they can keep you trapped in the physical, not looking at anything spiritual, then they got you. You know. So so with uh, pornography, you're trapped in the physical. Yeah, exactly. You're you're, you're exactly. fixated on the physical with alcohol and drugs. You're fixated on the physical. That's, you're not thinking about anything spiritual at all. That's why they hate beauty and architecture and stuff because it, it elevates, it elevates like your vibration. When you think about like, why would someone create something so beautiful? You know, you start thinking about the, like a higher vibration. That's why they just like boxes and squares and ugly, you know, to keep you like yeah. trying to feel good. Is there anything we can do to try and help your son? I mean, I know a lot of, a lot of really 
interesting people with a lot of this background. I mean, a lot of my listeners have experienced some pretty crazy shit and they might, I don't know, maybe it's, do you think he well, just can't, is, he won't, he won't listen. He won't listen to anybody or anything. Yeah. He just won't listen. Just goes, does what he wants to do. And he, he's, what does he say when you try and like, does it, is there like a, does he give a reason why he won't listen or he just, or he just won't? He, he's, he, he's so disorganized. Um, you know, so he, he, he's just all over the place. He forgets his keys and forgets his, his wallet. He, you know, he's a mess. We can't get him into a psych hospital. I mean, at least there they can give him some drugs that'll calm him down. You know, but he, he won't do that. Now I went to Mexico and got him some, he won't take them. You know, he, he's not like your typical guy. He's just got this wall up that is impenetrable. He won't listen to anything I say or anything my wife says. He just blocks it out. Whoa. And, and growing up, he always had a little bit of that. It just got worse with. Yeah. It just got much worse. Whoa, he man. always had a, he always had that, but it, it, it's, it's on steroids right now. Um, yeah, it's like gotta be his choice. That's what makes it so, I mean that the free will realm we live in is a two way street. It's like, you can't force, I, like my, you know, my dad is, is operating in complete delusion at all times. And I, it used to affect me negatively a lot. Like he'd lie about the time if it served his interest. Like he would say it's eight hours later, doesn't care, you know, and always the victim and always lying and spending. And I used to get so angry because I couldn't change that. And then I just accepted yeah. it. And then my anger went down. But to have that as your son is another level of like frustration, you know? And I just can't imagine that. But like, fuck, he's got to do it himself. Right. He's, and that's what I told my wife. You know, he has got to ask for the help. We can't force him to do it. Yeah. And he's still young enough. I mean... I know some people in their early thirties that were crazy and now are doing great. So, you know, it's possible. It's totally possible. I mean, Jack bad in the chat. I mean, he was schizophrenic as a loon about two years ago. Now he's working in Missouri. Um, yeah, man, this has been an epic talk. I, I love what you're doing and you're really like just revealing that the voices are like, outside of someone has been so helpful to so many people, man. And yeah, I get letters from people all the time. And one guy said, you know, now that I know they're not me, I can handle this. Exactly. Exactly. It's the gaslighting that's even worse because a human can, can acclimate and adapt to really horrifying conditions. And right now in the West, we're still rich and comfortable as hell. It's not like we're in the Gulag archipelago, you know, and so like, and even in prison, you can adapt, you can have a spiritual connection, you can work out, you can have a life. And so the worst trap is not knowing what enemy you're even fighting. You know, that's like right. so, the art right. of war, so Sun Tzu. Yeah. If you, don't, if you don't know you have an enemy, you can't fight him. Exactly. And that's what's so despicable about psychiatry. They have done no research, psychology and psychiatry. They've done no research on the voices whatsoever. None. They have just... We are psychiatry. We are the high priest of mental health. We hereby proclaim that these voices are hallucinations because we say so. They're, they're, they're playing the entire population of the planet. Yeah, they're more of a religion than religion <laughs> because it's all yeah. faith-based. It's all like, I, like, you must hear what I... And the fact they change it every year reveals the scam. That's why, you know, I've, I have hope for, I have hope for people, man. I've, I've hope for the future, but you know, your son's generation is a rough spot. I know several parents that are dealing with that, like the, the aimlessness, the stubbornness, the, you know, and it's a bummer, man, but it's like getting that purpose, getting that community, getting that motivation. I can see it. I can see it unfolding. Like I see more and more women um, wanting to be homesteaders and moms and wives and stuff versus like dressing like prostitutes and throwing their lives away. I think, I think that 
poison is lessening a bit, which is really good to see, you know? Yeah. yeah but, you know, psychiatry's they, they're, what are you, gaslighting the entire planet. Yeah, 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 totally. You know, totally. And, and all, all, the West, all the mental health systems are similar. You know, France and Germany, it's all the same. It's all the same crap. If you're, if you're suffering from a psychological problem, go to the MACE internet site and find yourself a MACE practitioner before going to a psychiatrist and getting drugged because those drugs aren't going to cure anything. You know, and most psychological problems, MACE can cure in, a, in an hour or two. Most. Cure. I mean, gone. You're not affected by them anymore. All psychiatry is doing is drugging your brain. And all psychology is doing is bringing the stuff up over and over and over and over again. In a lot of cases, making you worse. Yeah, because it's almost they like the voices, no they like want to relive it. You know? Yeah. I've noticed that in certain types of psychiatry where it's like, tell me about your trauma. And it's almost like, right. they, like some entity wants to hear it, almost like a victory lap. Because I banned yeah. that in the chat. Like I'd be talking about stuff. And in the, like right now, the whole time I've been talking to you, I have like a, a high trust, high morality chat. And it helps me and it's funny and I get feedback. Whenever someone would be like, yeah, when I was eight, my father, I'm like, you're out of here, dude. Like you're it's like, oh, why can't I talk about it? It's like, because it's just going to bring it down. Like the entity wants that. And I'm not, right. th there is a private way we could have this conversation but if, like, because I get boxes, I mean, I get, I mean, this is from, this is from this week. Okay, I get, <laughs> I get letters all the time. And there's so many of them are about triumph and beauty and gratitude. And but when someone's like going through the details of trauma, I don't read it. I'm like, because something feeds on that. Like, that's not going right. to help you to keep to keep like saying my identity is a rape victim. My identity is I was abused. My identity is a victim. And I, I tell that to my Jewish friends where I'm like, having your identity be the Holocaust is very negative. Like have your identity be all the other things you guys have done. Like just to have that one thing. I'm like, something's feeding on that dude. Cause I see it in my life. Like, you know, imagine so a woman gets raped and the rest of her life. It's like, hi, I'm Wendy. I'm a rape victim. It's like, Right. Like someone's feeding on that because you're so many other things. Like why be defined by that one thing? Like that one moment in your life should not define you, you know? Right. All right. Jerry, that's, you're, where, that's where, go ahead. that's where maze, maze comes in. You know, don't go to a psychiatrist before you look for a maze practitioner. You'll be wasting your money. Yeah. And have it be a combo where it's like, Cause I'm real into herbalism and holistic medicine and all that. And I'm also into the doctor when you have a broken leg, you know? So it's like, if you have these problems, what I would recommend is check out something like mace. I don't know much about it, but I, you know, Jerry does and see if that helps before you go right to the drugs. Cause there is a role for right. drugs. You know, if you have to calm down and start, you know, functioning, that there is a role for that, but don't, it's kind of like, it's the same with like dietary problems. It's like, do you have all the vitamins? Are you detoxing? Are you drinking? Are you hydrated? <laughs> you know? And so if you're going to the doctor for these problems and you haven't done basic nutritional situation, like you're just going to be chasing dragons, you know? Right. And so why not try something first that might be able to help you? You know, like my son, it was very anemic and it's like, we just started giving him a lot of iron and very quickly he's walking and smiling and talking. He's just low on iron. Like that was literally it. And so I, I'm guessing it's like that with mental health too. You know, it's about like these trauma cancer tumors in there. And if, right. there, if there is a way to get that out, great. All right. So where, there can is a way to get that out. where can people find you? I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fans after this, uh, after this stream. Well, my website is jerrymarzinski.com. And uh, uh, you, you can you can contact me through there. And there's we have a lot of videos on the, on there on this on this topic. And so, you know, send me a link when you have one. I'll I'll post that on on my site also. I absolutely will, and we'll be uh, praying for your son because I think prayers do help. You know, they there is like a. 
I don't know what it is, man. It's kind of like oh you, yeah, yeah, they they do. Yeah, even yeah, for that, that's what the, yeah for other people that's what too. The, yeah, yeah, that that's what people can do. They could pray. They could pray. That that does that does work. It does. All right, Jerry. Well, thanks for taking your time, my friend. And I will um, I'll send you the link when it's up, and I'll I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right, later, my friend. Peace. All right, take care. Bye. All right, that was the great Jerry Marzinski. Uh, that was an incredible chat, man. Fuck. That was that was just beautiful. Hang on, I gotta text somebody real quick. Um, real quick. Just give me one second, then we'll talk about everything. Uh, come. Uh, one second. Come. All right, cool. That was fucking awesome, man. And you can tell the pain that he's in about his son. And I've never known that about him. That was, I think, the first interview I've ever seen him talk about that. And I've, I know I was, try, I was a little chatty because I fanboy out. But I know in the past, I can really annoy people when I talk over them. And I, I was trying not to do that. But I just get so pumped talking about demons. Anyway, okay, so let's just do the Super Chats. And then... Uh, and then we'll call it a day. And don't forget to subscribe to unauthorized.tv. Uh, yeah, that was great. What a guy. Yeah, I mean, such an incredible story. Uh, I don't know anything about the mace. I'd like to know more about the mace method, but uh, I don't know anything about it. But it's just, uh, I like that there's other options than just, you know, the cement cages. Epic says Jagabat. Yeah, Jagabat. Oh, and I made him laugh. It's the first time I've ever seen Marzinski laugh. I got at least two laughs out of him. I keep score. All right, thanks for the weekend streams. Update for all British Bears in Southeast England. There will be a bear meetup this weekend in Bedford. Saturday and Sunday, bring the family. Howler at Mashdown Babylon on the BT app or Telegram. Peace and blessings. Indeed, Mashdown Babylon Bear. Sounds a little aggressive of a bear name. Let's not, let's not go at Babylon. Let's build what we are building. I mean... I think after this stream, you guys can really see the method to my madness about when it comes to fighting the wicked and darkness of this world. It's all about um, what we build, how we protect ourselves versus going at them. Going at them is not the ideal situation at all. In fact, I think they feed on it. Thanks for an epic Sunday stream. Anytime. Burka Bear, way overdue super chat. Thanks for having Jerry on. He's awesome. Titty Sprinkles. I don't know what titty sprinkles means, but that sounds pretty uh, intense. Hi, Tech Bear. Thank you, BB and Jerry. Fantastic conversation. Mr. Mar Marzinski, can you speak a bit more on Swedenborg, Swedenborg and what aspects of his work influenced you? Well, you talked a little bit about that, about how um, Swedenborg talked about how our thoughts are not our own. You can look that stuff up. Keep pushing past those demons. That was a badass live. Great eye-opening revelations on demonic possession. Strong prayers for the doctor. Take a brave soul to keep, just keep diving in. Entire community just got a spiritual upgrade on this. Listen, God bless again, BB. Uh, defeated two, two, defeat two horns, bear. Alexandra, thank you, Owen. Thank you, Jerry. What a blessing to have you with us. And I really appreciate the Christmas card. Very beautiful handwriting. Thank you, Alexandra. Sea Cow, I rarely have evil thoughts, and when I do, it's more like a movie in my head than a voice. Very visual. Have you had patients like that? Is there anything different or notable about them? Well, I would say, as your new doctor, Sea Cow, what's notable about you is just how special of a boy you are. There's no one like you. Cortisol Bearer, they made a fictional movie recently called Nefarious about a psychiatrist who evaluates a convict claiming to be possessed by demons. It's pretty bad, but not terrible. You know, I mean, that's probably about Jerry. They probably just stole his fucking life story. Big Bear, please ask Jerry about personality disorders such as bipolar, borderline, etc. cetera. Uh, Antisocial personality disorder and cluster B disorder, the causes and treatment options. It would help my family a lot to understand them. Uh, I think he got into that. And um, also, don't just get off your meds if you're on meds. Um... Jerry pointed out the nefarious agenda around for-profit pharmaceuticals. I'm not in a position at all to tell you what you should or should not take. 
and uh, just getting off your meds could result in horror. So just just look into other things. Look into like look into what the nature of the entities are. Check out that Mace method that he was talking about. I don't know anything about it, so I'm not personally endorsing it, but it's good to check those things out. Uh, but don't just get off your meds, you know, because uh, because I don't know the situation you're in and I'm not in an ability to analyze that. Some people, their life falls apart if they're off their meds. It's just true. I, you know, fascinating stream. Thank you guys. Jerry has a new fan. Nice. And then I got a couple more here. You stated that the American native killed all their buffalo. That goes against logic and mainstream media and U.S. historical propaganda and image. Do you know of information that supports that? Yeah, every single tribe I've ever known overfishes and overhunts immediately. When I was in Washington, there was a tribe there given unlimited rights to the salmon and they killed all the salmon immediately. So uh, it's, you, can, you can look into that. Have a good time. Okay, uh, not claiming it's a race thing. But that is what happens when you escalate your technology too fast. So like, let's say your brain is functional with pornography being a picture. And then you're given 4K HD porn in your pocket all the time for all the porn in the world. And you can see how that's massively destroyed a lot of, uh, a lot of young people. You know, white, black, whatever. I'm not saying it's an Indian thing. So... It, it is logical because uh, most people are not functioning for their own best interest. They overindulge over and over. America, the richest country in the world, was taking loans from China at the time the poorest country in the world. How is that fucking logical? If Indians are, are hunting buffalo for thousands of years with a bow and arrow and a spear and no horses and they're given horses and guns, what do you think would happen immediately? Okay? Um, that's it. Uh, Kyneton, are we caught up? Definitely have to wean off meds slowly and structure. You got to talk to a, a professional about that. But with the new knowledge that these entities are not because your brain is broken. And there are people that are actively trying to sell you drug addictions. All right. Um... Here's Joe. Thanks for today. BB and Jerry, best comedian interview, gravy later of all time. Why, thank you. Did I get the Rockfin Rumbles? Yeah, it was, uh, it was the Buffalo guy who wrote like eight paragraphs, but I feel like I addressed it. And then uh, Fasting Baron Rockfin, right? Is that it, Kyneton? Agreed. Trying to get off meds without a stable plan is a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of these meds, they get you addicted to them. So if you get off them, you can get like suicidal really quickly. Uh, Adderall for 17 years, bro. Getting off was roughly a, a rough adjustment. How did that work for you? Are you good now? Cause like I've taken Adderall before I've had an Adderall prescription and man, that does give you a fucking real pep in your step, especially if you're cleaning, um, if you're doing like manual labor or driving, like, is there like, like if you've been on Adderall for long periods of time and you get off, does your energy just like never come back? You know, is it like coffee or is it, yes, I'm good, BB. Good for you, mullet bear. Good for, or pickle bear. All right, final super chats. Because like small amounts of Adderall when prescribed is like a little bit like that movie Limitless. Like you can just get so much shit done and then you get used to it and then you have a hard time sleeping and then you kind of like, like without it, like just being on Adderall is like normal. And at that point, getting off it would be a massive crash. Okay, moving on. Um, H -bomb. The side effects of Depakate. I don't know. I'm not getting into this shit. Physical symptoms from withdrawal. Yeah, it hurt a lot for me. Physical symptoms from withdrawal can be worse than the mental symptoms. Hmm. Okay. Uh, wonder stream. Thank you. Good stream. Uh, awesome. I, yeah. I'm by the way, I'm not in a position at all to talk about any drug at all. Like the only pharmaceutical I've ever taken was Adderall for short periods of time prescribed. And, um, and that's it. Like, I don't know anything about opiates or, uh, 
antipsychotics or anti-stressors uh, like at all. So anything that I read, I'm not endorsing and I have no, I have no idea what they are. Low dose naltorexone can help if you had an Adderall or opiate problems. I have no idea what any of that means, so don't listen to me right now. Okay, that's going to be it for me today. Much love to Jerry Marzinski and say a prayer for his son. I mean, that was painful. But I, felt, I felt that. I felt that man's pain. Um, take small amounts at night, resets dopamine. Take small amounts. I, what? I quit pain pills and cocaine in 06 with marijuana. Good for you, Limbaugh Morrison Bear. Uh, like when I get off coffee, I get a splitting fucking headache. So I'm not going to criticize you for being an addict. Like being an addict sucks and don't be an addict. But my coffee situation, and I don't even drink that much. I drink like two coffees, in, uh, two cups in every single morning with cream. Um, if I am sick and I don't drink coffee for a few days, it's like a nail is in my brain. Oh, I'm good now, but I wasn't after I was off Adderall. It made me bipolar, but I'm glad you're good now. Uh, I stopped my drug addiction by never taking drugs ever, so I never got addicted. Good one, Kyneton. The best move is to just never take them. The reason that I was exposed to Adderall was I'd be on the road. Uh, it was never to perform comedy or to talk because it makes me like a retard kind of. Like, I'm just like... It would be if I had five in the morning, I had 5 a.m. Uh, media, and then uh, like five to 9 a.m. media, and I had 7 p.m. show, 11 p.m. show, mi midnight show. And then the next day I had 5 a.m. Uh, media. It would be like to regulate my sleep and to have energy with like no sleep at all. Um, and the problem with it is it makes you not get restful sleep and uh, and you adapt to it very quickly. Made me a super, yeah. Like I don't put together, like I don't I don't gravy flow on Adderall, but I what I could do is drive for like twenty hours. You know, like uh, when I'd be on the road, we do a show, eight p.m. show, ten o'clock show, midnight show. Like when I was on Sullivan and Son, I was asked to do so much on the road with morning radio shows. Travel, driving, nonstop. It's, it's, t I totally understand why road warrior guys get those like uh, pills at the truck stops and all that shit because it's like, you're like, oh yeah, this will help me not fall asleep while I'm driving or this will help me like be able to perform in the morning and at night and drive. But there's a crash that comes. Like you start not having like that 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 like mind connection to the infinite that every artist needs uh Adderall can get you to like not feel that anymore but you get it back you get it back pretty fast okay but like if you know don't think that when I'm like cleaning my barn I'm not like man an Adderall would make this go great <laughs> like obviously that's a thought that I've had in my head all right moving on Unauthorized.tv, P.O. Box 490, Sandpoint, Idaho, 83864. Enter bstream.live slash app slash Owen Benjamin Comedy. BertariaCampgrounds.com, magazine.BertariTimes.com. Uh, you only have those available this month. And then Merch for Bears. See, Kyle, we'll send you something real nice. I could make so many worthless edits to my thesis on Adderall. Yeah, you're like... You're like, wow, I got to really reorganize everything according to color. Uh, all right. Be fruitful. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Be fruitful, multiply. Don't be fruity and boil, guy.